Subcommittee will come to order. Uh, first, I ask unanimous consent the chair be authorized to declare a recess at any time during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions. Without objection, so ordered. As a reminder, please keep your microphones muted unless speaking. And if we hear any inadvertent background noise, I request that members please mute their microphone. Also a reminder to uh, insert a document into the record. Please have your staff email it to documents, T and I, at mail.house.gov. And that's T uh, with the uh, appersand uh, and then I. So good morning and welcome to today's uh, witnesses joining the Aviation Subcommittee's hearing titled Disruption in the Skies, the Surge in Air Rage and its Effects on Workers, Airlines, and Airports. As the nation works to get to the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic, the surge in public air rage incidents has exacerbated the already tenuous workforce situation in our aviation sector and eroded confidence in air travel. These incidents have also put the safety of frontline workers, passengers, and the nation's aviation system at risk and could potentially lead to further safety issues. Unruly passenger behavior is not necessarily new. From 2015 to 2020, the FAA initiated a, to initiated a total of 786 investigations into unruly passenger behavior. However, through the first nine months of 2021, the FAA has initiated 789 investigations. Airlines have filed 4,385 unruly passenger complaints since the beginning of the calendar year, including 3,199 mask-related complaints. As Sarah Nelson will testify from the AFA CWA, frontline aviation workers have to deal with everything from vulgar language, including racial epithets, to punching, kicking, biting, shoving, and spitting from passengers. This behavior is from a small percentage of the traveling public, but it is disgusting, it is unacceptable, and it is a danger to fellow passengers, to crew, and the entire U.S. aviation system. Congress, the federal government, and the aviation industry must work together to protect airline crews, airport staff, and the traveling public from passenger outbursts, while also preparing for the next public health and national security crises. As subcommittee chair, I made aviation safety and enhancing the air travel experience for passengers and crews a priority. Three years ago, I worked with then subcommittee chair, Frank Lobiondo, uh, and, and others to pass the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018, which, increased the maximum civil penalty per unruly passenger violation by 48% to $37,000. When incidents began to rise after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, Chair DeFazio and I encouraged FAA Administrator Dixon to use the full weight of federal law to protect airline passengers and crews ahead of the inauguration. Earlier this year, the FAA announced a series of measures to combat passenger issues, including a zero tolerance policy and a public awareness campaign that showed noticeable results. But Congress and government agencies can only do so much. And I was encouraged to see this week that FAA urged airlines to take additional steps to address this issue, though there is confusion about what FAA is asking of airlines and others in the aviation sector. I look forward from, to hearing from today's witnesses about the enforcement of US laws prohibiting such behavior and what more Congress and agencies can do to support frontline workers. And the public health response must lead economic recovery. And as one thing that we can learn from today is the lessons that lessons learned from the ongoing pandemic show the urgent need for a national aviation preparedness plan to improve the safety of aviation crews, employees, and passengers to minimize disruptions to the national aviation system and restore confidence in air travel. And I would ask uh, members to consider supporting my bill, the National Aviation Preparedness Plan Act, which I introduced earlier this year with my colleague, Don Beyer. Before we begin, begin I want to thank the women and men on the front lines of the aviation industry who continue to keep people and the economy moving forward during these very difficult times. Today's witnesses represent stakeholders for air carriers, airports, and frontline workers who can speak to the current situation and what changes need to be made to reduce these incidents. I'm pleased to welcome Sarah Nelson, International President of the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA. Ms. Nelson will provide the subcommittee with personal experiences, both as a frontline flight attendant and as president of a union representing 17 airlines across the aviation sector. Mr. Teddy Andrews 
As a longtime flight attendant with United Airlines, we'll be speaking today on behalf of the Association of Professional Flight Attendants. Mr. Andrews can provide his first-hand experience as a frontline flight attendant during the COVID-19 pandemic, highlighting the horrifying abuse he has been subjected to while, as he will say, simply doing his job. Ms. Lauren Beyer is Vice President for Security and Facilitation for Airlines uh, for America and has worked on a variety of issues related to aircraft safety during the pandemic. I look forward to hearing from her about airline industry's efforts to address passenger behavior and what other support airlines need, to, uh, need in order to do so. The subcommittee will also hear from Mr. Christopher Bidwell, Senior Vice President of Security at Airports Council International North America. It's important to hear steps, the steps that airports are taking to prevent potential unruly passengers from boarding aircraft, as well as additional measures Congress and agencies can undertake. In my district and of course across the country, transportation means jobs and is key to the economic recovery. And without a safe, reliable commercial air travel industry, I would uh, not be able to get to and from work. Many of us would not be able to get to and from the work here in Congress and back home again. My constituents would not be able to travel to see family and friends and frontline aviation workers would be without a job. Congress, the federal government, the aviation industry must work together to reduce unruly passenger incidents and ensure passengers and crews uh, that the um, airlines are safe to fly. So I look forward to today's discussion on how to best support your critical work moving forward. Now I want to turn, before I turn to the uh, ranking member, Mr. Grayson, Louisiana, I'll just remind members that if you're speaking, uh, you may, um, under the rules, you may take your mask off. If you're not speaking, to please wear a mask. With that, I'll turn to... Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to see the rule enforced. Um, I hope it won't provoke violence, but um, members on the other side need to wear their mask. All, all members are to wear their mask if not speaking. Um, if you are speaking, you may take your mask off. That is, if you're, if you're recognized to speak, not if you're speaking at a turn, uh, you may uh, take your mask off. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank you for having this hearing today, and I want to make very clear from the beginning um, that the behavior we've seen in the media in regard to some of the adverse interactions on, on airplanes is completely unacceptable. Um, it, it needs to be a, a civil experience for everyone on the plane, and obviously there's additional safety considerations for being tens of thousands of feet up in the air in a, in a, metal, uh, in a metal airplane um, when, when thinking about this. Uh, flight attendants, gate agents, and other airline employees have the right to go to work uh, without the fear of being harassed, intimidated, abused, uh, or assaulted, period. Um, FAA is correct for uh, strenuously enforcing uh, the rules and, and regulations that, that are applicable to air travel and for holding people accountable for failing to comply. Um, and that unruly and illegal behavior shall not be tolerated, period. Um, data shows that there are more cases of unruly behavior and that, and that, um, and that we are seeing a spike or, or increases. And I think it's important to look at the causes, to look at, at, at how we can mitigate that, to how we can solve the problems. There have been, uh, I believe the chairman noted, uh, 4,284 complaints of unruly passenger, passengers as of September 14th. Um, but let's remember that so far this year, more than 350 uh, passengers have, have flown. 350 million passengers have flown. Um, so if you do the math there, that's 0. 0.000, excuse me, 0. 0.001. And that's like comparing the population of New Roads, Louisiana, a town that I represent, that y'all haven't heard of, uh, but you should go visit False River, it's a lot of fun, uh, to the population of the entire country. Um, and, and so, uh, the vast majority of flights occur without these types of, of air rage incidents. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that, that this hearing may convey to people on the outside that getting on an airplane is a, is a, is a wild and unruly experience. And I, and I think that, um, that it, it's really important for us to convey to folks that that's, that's absolutely not the norm, that's the exception. And I'll say it again, 0.001% of, of, of uh, passengers end up having an unruly incident. Um, but I also think that we've got to look at this not just from the perspective of the airlines or the airline employees or others, we've got to look at this thing holistically. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I want to 
read some statistics. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, in January 2021, four in 10 adults re uh, reported symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder, up from one in 10 adults. So four in 10 now, it was up from one in 10 from January to June of 2019. Overall, 2020 values show a 50% increase uh, overdose-related cardiac arrest, a 50% increase in, in cardiac arrest related to, to overdose. Um, uh, mental distress, the number of, of March 2020 calls to the disaster distress line at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, was 891% higher than March the year before. And, and perhaps a little bit closer to home for some of us here, the Capitol Police have reported 400, excuse me, 4,135 threats against lawmakers during the first three months of 2021 alone, putting the number of threats on track to double those from last year. Mr. Chairman, my, my, my point here is that we're seeing increased anxiety in society, whether it's, it's mental health and depression, it's domestic violence, it's substance abuse, mental distress, or other types of, of, of uh, challenges that are across government. Now, let's look specifically at the air travel experience. Uh, from the passenger perspective, maybe it's a person or a family that doesn't travel often, doesn't travel as often as, as some people here, perhaps. They have, to, they have to think about packing their bags, getting their kids all together, getting to the airport in time, getting everything in the car, finding a parking spot, getting on the shuttle, getting in line at the, at the, at the airport to check bags in, getting in line at TSA, which who knows how that experience is gonna go. I recently had a TSA agent make me walk through the metal detector four times because I was told that I wasn't walking through it right. I don't even know what that looks like. I, I, I've walked through metal detectors thousands and thousands of times. I do it every day here, and I was told I walked through it wrong. I had another TSA guy tell me that I didn't let the dog sniff me properly. Uh, I don't even know what this stuff means. Now let's keep going. So then you get into the airport, you get to buy your $6 bottle of water, your $12 granola bar, you get to sit on a plane, and yes, it's packed. And, and just like my flight experience coming here, I got up at 4 a.m. this week, I left the house at 5 a.m., and let's see, by the time I got to take, when I walked in the airport and got, finally got to D.C. because of, of problems, I think it was eight or nine hours later, wearing a mask the entire time. Mr. Chairman, I think it's important for us to contrast that with the experiences people maybe had at the airport where they sat down at a table with other people and, and were sitting there eating without mask on. We've seen all the data showing how, how clean the air on flights are, and, 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 and the, the low transmission rates are virtually non-existent transmission rates that are on airplanes. So, Mr. Chairman, here's my point. I just, I, I, I'm glad we're having this hearing, but I think it's really important that we look at this from the passenger perspective as well. Some, I met with Tampa Airport yesterday. The guy used the term trying to decompress the experience. How do we look at this holistically and decompress that entire experience from parking to TSA to uh, bags and everything else to make this a, a lower stress experience? Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I, I, look forward to, I look forward to hearing from the, from the witnesses today, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we can move in a direction that, that truly is productive. I'm, I'm uh, excited or uh, optimistic that, that some of the data FAA released today showed a significant decline in, in air rage incidences, and I hope that we can build upon that success. Yield back. Thank you. And now call on the uh, chair of the full committee, Mr. DeFazio, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for holding uh, this. Yeah, incidents are down 50%. They're still twice the level of last year. Um, and minimizing, uh, oh, like a flight attendant who gets her teeth knocked out, uh, or some jerk who uh, tries to open the exit door or uh, crash the, uh, you know, into the cockpit. Of course, the FAA is dragging its feet on secondary barriers, which we mandated a number of years ago, but that's an issue for another day. But um, it's still too high. I think the uh, zero tolerance and the publicized fines has an impact. Uh, but uh, we need more prosecutions when there are serious violent incidents on airplanes. Uh, and uh, you know, there needs to be more cooperation uh, between uh, the airlines, the airports, the local police, uh, and the federal authorities. And I, I hope that uh, we can engender that. You know, I never saw, uh, I've flown about 8 million miles, been doing this a long time. Uh, until recently, I never saw a big sign in the airport saying alcohol to go in cups. That's got to stop. It's illegal to bring your own alcohol onto a plane, but how are you going to tell? 
you know? Is it a coffee? Is it a soda? Uh, what is it? Uh, but the airports need to crack down on these vendors, or we need to find a way to induce the airports to crack down on these vendors. That is literally encouraging people to break the law. Get a great big to-go cup with four shots in it and uh, take it on the airplane. So uh, that, that needs to end. Uh, we're going to hear uh, a lot of suggestions here today uh, about how we can better deal with this, and uh, you know, we will look at what further actions this committee can take. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and now I want to welcome the witnesses on today's panel. Uh, in order, we'll have Ms. Sarah Nelson, International President, Association of Flight Attend Attendants, uh, Mr. Teddy Andrews, Flight Attendant, I'm sorry, at American Airlines, I'll make a correction in my opening statement on that, on behalf of the Association of Professional Flight Attendants, Mr. Christopher Bed uh, Bidwell, Senior Vice President, Security Airports Council, North America, and Ms. Lauren Beyer, Vice President, Security and Facilitation, Airlines for America. Thank you for joining us today. I look forward to your testimony, and without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record, and since your written testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Ms. Nelson, you may proceed. Thank you, Chairman Larson, uh, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, and Ranking Member Graves. Uh, for this hearing on the surge in air rage incidents and the effect it has on workers, airports, and airlines. I am a 25-year union flight attendant and president of the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA, AFL-CIO. We also coordinate closely with the leaders of APFA and TWU, together representing nearly 100,000 flight attendants. As part of the Communication Workers of America, we represent ground service workers and can also speak to the impact on workers at the gates. And of course, we work closely with all of the aviation unions who make up the Transportation Trades Department of the AFL-CIO. This is a subject that is of great importance to all aviation workers. Since January, the FAA has logged 4,284 unruly passenger reports. About three quarters of those are mask related. Of these numbers, 755 investigations have been initiated. 154 cases have concluded with enforcement of over a million dollars in fines. If we continue at this rate, there may be more incidents in 2021 than in the entire history of aviation. But for the first time, we're hearing from the FAA that some of our efforts together has these numbers trending down. There's so much more to do, though, because these incidents are still too common, if, if even only from a small percentage of passengers of those who are flying. We cannot forget the devastating consequences of leaving commercial aircraft vulnerable to terrorist attack. We know there are two fundamentals in aviation safety and security. Number one, remove all distractions from safety sensitive work. And number two, leave all threats to safety and security on the ground. If we allow disruptions in the cabin or distractions due to defiance of passengers to comply with crew instructions to become regular occurrence, we are in jeopardy of missing cues of a coordinated attack. Flight attendants are the eyes throughout the aircraft for threats to safety of flight depressurization, fires, medical emergencies, including potential medical emergencies in the flight deck. We cannot afford to lose any time when responding to emergency or preparing for an emergency landing. Disturbances in the cabin are also a distraction in the flight deck and could compromise the safety of flight. In response to a survey of flight attendants across the industry, 85% of respondents had dealt with unruly passengers in the first half of this year, and 58% and of those had experienced at least five occurrences. This used to just be a one-off bad day at work in, a, in an entire career, so this is very commonplace. Disturbingly, one in five experienced physical altercations. 61% of disruptive passengers used racist, sexist, or homophobic slurs during the events. Only 60% of uh, those who relayed incidents of physical attack said that law enforcement was requested to meet the flight. Of all the incidents in the air, 50% showed that, showed that signs of trouble were starting on the ground. This signals both that workers at the gate are experiencing abuse and half of these incidents could be kept on the ground with better response and coordination. While 85% of the incidents are mask related, flight attendants report there are many contributing factors, the next highest being alcohol. FAA Administrator Steve Dixon sent a letter to all airports calling for better communication on masks, 
the federal re regulations on alcohol, the discontinuation of to-go alcohol, and I think we have some pictures of this that can be shown, and coordination with law enforcement to make sure consequences are clear for bad actors. Stopping to-go alcohol should be low-hanging fruit here, but as I included in my written testimony, and you, as you see on the screen with examples from JFK, Phoenix, and St. Louis, they are not the only airports to do this. Not only has this practice not stopped, it is encouraged and promoted, giving passengers the false idea that they can bring their own alcohol on board and encouraging as much drinking as possible. Flight attendants and gate agents then experience extensive verbal abuse, yelling and swearing in response to instructions, shoving, kicking seats, biting, punching, throwing trash at workers, defiling restrooms after instructions are given, following flight crew and agents throughout the airport and continuing to yell and harass. The danger in this hostile environment in response to flight attendants simply conducting routine safety reminders and compliance is hesitancy in performing these tasks. Aviation safety is at risk when crew are deterred from or delayed in performing our safety duties. Now, what do we need? We need DOJ criminal charges and enforcement. Make the FAA zero tolerance policy permanent and give staff up investigators and extend investigation time. Coordinated communication, including PSAs running throughout the terminal on masks, alcohol, and generally following the rules from point of ticket sale, all through check-in, security, gate, and the boarding process. Require that all airport bars, restaurants, and shops post signage and use verbal warnings to patrons who fail co to comply with masking requirements. Every airline and airport should have a communication plan that they submit to ensure we're all working together across government stakeholders and law enforcement. Enforcement of masks in the terminal and stopping the ability for passengers to become inebriated. More staffing at the gates and on the planes. We simply cannot accept this as the new normal. We look forward to working with this subcommittee to affect positive change. I want to note that aviation is about bringing people together, not tearing us apart. Every person matters, and we can only have the freedom of flight when we recognize the reality that we are all in this together. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Nelson, and now turn to Mr. Teddy Andrews. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman DeFazio, Chairman Larson, Ranking Member Sam Graves, Ranking Member Garrett Graves, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Teddy Andrews. I'm an American Airlines flight attendant of 10 years. My career in the airline aviation industry began in 1981, where I served in many positions, including gate agent, flight attendant trainer, and customer service instructor. I'm honored to be representing APFA and my 25,000 colleagues to discuss the most significant challenge and daily danger facing flight attendants right now. Air rage has unfortunately become all too common. I've lost count the times I've been insulted or threatened on a flight simply for doing my job. The specific incident that I will share today is not easy to talk about. On this flight, my crew had just completed our service. My colleague on the verge of tears came to the galley after a passenger who refused to wear a mask had been giving her a hard time. I left the galley to speak with the passenger. Politely, I asked, sir, would you please put your mask on? It must be covering both your mouth and nose. He looked at me and I will not repeat the epithet he used. He said, in word, I don't have to listen to a damn thing you say. This is a free country. I was completely taken aback. I didn't know what to say, but he continued. You heard me in word, boy. While I'm trained for this, I know I don't deserve to be spoken to like this under any circumstance. But I replied, sir, regardless of your thoughts, comments, or opinions, there is a mass requirement on board our aircraft and failure to comply could restrict your ability to fly with us in the future. We wouldn't want that to happen to you, sir. He cited his freedoms and he called me the mass police. I said, if you don't do it for yourself, please do it for your family, who I'm sure loves you very much and would be devastated if something were to happen to you. Please do it for your fellow passengers as well. He eventually calmed down and complied. I myself have a personal experience with this virus. I understand the importance of mass mandate. In March of 2020, I contracted COVID-19 and nearly died. The ER called my daughter on her 24th birthday to say that it would be a miracle if I made it through the morning. After 10 days in the ICU, I stabilized, but 
but I was not able to work again until September of 2020. I could barely walk across the room without oxygen. The work environment I returned to had changed and that incident I shared is not unique to me or my colleagues. Air rage comes in many forms, insults, threats, physical assaults, general disrespect, simply for adhering to our responsibilities. I too wear my mask for hours on end. I know what is at stake if we don't utilize all safety precautions to beat this pandemic. Last year, we came to work when everyone else was told to stay home. When demand for air travel dropped off steeply, we worried about our job security. And I'd like to thank this committee for passing the payroll support program, which saved our jobs, our health care, and the industry. I cringe to think what would have happened to me in the ICU without health insurance. Now, flight attendants are in a third phase of crisis, worried about our safety just by coming to work and fulfilling our duties. Today, we find ourselves in an environment where we may need the voluntary self-defense skills offered by TSA. The question, however, is how to prevent these situations from escalating to that point. Medical emergencies, onboard fires, security threats, and emergency evacuations are situations that we are prepared for every day, every flight. But now our most immediate danger is air rage. These days I come to work anticipating disruptive behavior. It feels like flight attendants have become the target for all kinds of frustration. But every day, flight attendants are disrespected for the job we are trained to do. My colleagues are anxious and fearful. What is going to happen on the next flight? How will this passenger react if I remind them to wear their mask? Will complying with airline policy set them off? Can I avoid engaging? Or would that be an invasion of my duties? Many of you travel on this committee, you travel every week and understand the challenges of air travel today. We cannot combat air rage without coordination at the federal level. Our passengers need clear expectations and strong consequences for their behavior. One more air rage event, one more flight attendant who is threatened or assaulted is one too many. Thank you for your work to help keep my colleagues and I saved my testimony is complete and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your testimony. And I wanna recognize um, Chris Bidwell, just a moment. I wanna recognize Mr. Christopher Bidwell from the Airports Council International North America. Mr. Bidwell, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Larson, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's hearing. I'm Christopher Bidwell, Senior Vice President of Security at Airports Council International North America. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the work of airport operators in responding to and helping to reduce the number of unruly passenger incidents. As the security of their passengers, employees, tenants, and facilities is their top priority, airports implement a number of measures. Airports coordinate these security measures with their partners at the TSA, FAA, FBI, other federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, and the airlines. COVID has created a lot of stress for our members, our industry, and the traveling public. Due to that stress, many people are acting differently in various aspects of their lives, and air travel is no different. While it's easy to blame the rise of unruly passenger incidents on one cause or another, there are a variety of factors that contribute to the incidents to which our airport members are asked to respond. We applaud the FAA for implementing a zero tolerance policy. We also appreciate TSA for having doubled the civil penalty violations for the federal mass mandate. Much has been discussed in the press about the role of alcohol and the behavior of unruly passengers, but we have yet to see data on the number of incidents that involve alcohol. Bartenders in restaurants and bars at airports must be certified and trained by local alcohol licensing authorities. Airport concessionaires are subject to the same licensing, oversight, and inspection requirements in order to maintain a license to serve alcohol as any other establishment in the local community. 
Airports work with their airline partners on initiatives to raise awareness about the FAA regulation prohibiting passengers from drinking their own alcohol on board aircraft. With certain states and communities having lifted mask requirements, many residents were surprised, frustrated, or even upset by TSA's extension of the mask mandated airports and calls for airport law enforcement support increased significantly. This remains an added burden on airport law enforcement that is in addition to their existing responsibilities. Airport law enforcement faces a number of challenges when called by airlines to respond to unruly passenger incidents. Whereas interference with crew members is a federal offense under Title 49 of the United States Code, Section 46504, airport law enforcement can only enforce state and local law. Depending on the nature of the incident, airport law enforcement officers may only be able to conduct a cursory investigation and turn the case over to federal authorities. Let me be clear, airport law enforcement attempts to hold unruly passengers accountable for their dangerous behavior while operating in accordance with state and local law. In some instances, airline crew members are reluctant to stay around to press charges, even when they have been assaulted. Unless crew members press charges, airport law enforcement officers may not be able to legally detain the unruly passenger. We are committed to being part of the solution and encourage the implementation of the following recommendations. First, airline gate agents as the first line of defense should be extra vigilant for signs and deny boarding to those individuals they suspect are intoxicated. Second, when an incident occurs, airline crew members should make statements to airport law enforcement and press charges to enable criminal prosecution. Third, airport law enforcement should be provided the flexibility to prioritize the response to unruly passenger incidents. Fourth, FAA and TSA should share more detailed and timely data on incidents with airport operators to ensure better situational awareness. Fifth, the US government should prioritize the prosecution of individuals who interfere with crew members and broadly publicize successful criminal prosecutions and civil penalty actions. ACINA and our member airports are committed to working with Congress, FAA, TSA, FBI, and other law enforcement agencies and aviation stakeholders to identify good practices to reduce the number of unruly passenger incidents. We look forward to coordinating with our industry and government partners to implement our recommendations to address this important issue. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Bidwell. I now recognize Ms. Lauren Beyer, Vice President, Security and Facilitation for Airlines for America. Ms. Beyer, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lauren Beyer, and I'm the Vice President of Security and Facilitation at Airlines for America. A4A appreciates the opportunity to testify today, and I'm honored to be presenting alongside our labor and airport partners on this important topic. The top priority of A4A passenger carriers is the safety and well being of all employees and passengers, and we are dedicated to working with our employees, government partners, and other private sector stakeholders to address unruly behavior and ensure that appropriate penalties for egregious conduct onboard aircraft are fully pursued. There is simply no place in our skies for passengers' unruly and disruptive behavior. I'd like to thank the leadership of this committee, specifically Chair Stefazio and Larson and Ranking Members Graves and Graves for your steadfast commitment and oversight of this issue. Your support and advocacy for strict enforcement of incidents has played a critical role in the federal government's continued enforcement of the Federal Aviation Administration's zero tolerance policy for travelers who do not follow crew member instructions and who do not abide by federal law. While most passengers, as has been noted, continue to comply with crew member instructions, we unfortunately have seen a very concerning uptick in unruly passengers aboard aircraft this year. And though the frequency of these incidents remains relatively low compared to passenger volume, even one unruly passenger event is one too many. Each incident is thoroughly investigated by the airline to determine the facts and details of the case, and the incidents are also reported to the FAA. 
In addition to the FAA's independent civil enforcement process and any potential criminal prosecution, A4A member airlines can choose to place a passenger on an internal no-fly list, denying that passenger from flying on that airline. Coordination and communication with our federal partners has been really critical. Airlines have been in regular communication with the FAA and the Transportation Security Administration to exchange information. We appreciate the FAA's efforts just this week to provide a forum for industry and government to share best practices and identify additional actions that can be taken across the entire aviation ecosystem. In June, A4A sent letters to the FAA and the Department of Justice requesting our federal partners do everything possible to increase the public awareness of the ramifications of unruly incidents. In the FAA letter, we requested the agency refer egregious cases to the DOJ so that they may swiftly prosecute criminal acts to the fullest extent of the law. The FAA compliance and enforcement program already directs this coordination when a case supports criminal enforcement action. A4A worked with a coalition of airline and labor partners to ask the Department of Justice to direct federal prosecutors to dedicate the resources for these egregious cases and to send a strong and consistent message through criminal enforcement that compliance with federal law and upholding aviation safety are of paramount importance. As the airline industry, we understand there are steps that we needed to take to better address the problem as well. Each of our member airlines has taken steps to evaluate what more can be done and make enhancements in consultation with their employee groups to policies, training, communications, and more. Earlier this year, A4A and our members began collecting and sharing best practices across carriers to improve the airline response to these incidents. Such best practices include the performance of safety risk assessments, management and employee training initiatives, and enhancements to customer-facing initiatives. These efforts have led to engagement across the broader industry to discuss collectively what more can be done. As a result, we are now working on a cross-industry, self-initiated best practices effort that includes my fellow panelists. We believe an industry-wide approach is beneficial so that all entities with responsible in the AV, responsibility, excuse me, in the aviation sector have visibility into what the other entities are doing to address the problem. We will continue to work together with labor, government partners, and other industry stakeholders to do everything possible to prevent and better respond to these incidents. Thank you again to the committee for raising awareness of this concerning trend, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Byron. That will now turn to member questions, and uh, I'll recognize myself uh, for five minutes. Um, uh, Ms. Nelson, my first question's uh, for you. Certainly in the continuum of trying to tamp down these incidents, there's a the prevention side, there's the manage management of the situation in the, in the, in the uh, cabin part, but then there's the enforcement as well of, of any charges. But um, in your survey, you said 60% of respondents experiencing a physical incident on board said law enforcement was requested to meet their flight. In those instances, did law enforcement meet the flight? Uh, Chairman Larson, in not every instance was uh, law enforcement actually able to meet the flight in time before the passenger left the scene. Um, but what's also concerning is that 40% of that time, we're talking about physical altercations here, uh, law enforcement was not requested to meet the flight, which means that there's a break in communication in some point here and even getting that request to law enforcement. But you are correct, not in every case did law enforcement actually meet the flight when there was a request. Yeah, and again, I want to under, I just want to reiterate, there's a prevention side, which I think we're going to explore a little bit. There's the management of the situation in the cabin and there's enforcement. So I'm not just saying it's only a law enforcement issue, but when it does need to occur, it should occur. Uh, Mr. Bidwell, you, you talked a little bit about the coordination, lack thereof, what improvements uh, can happen with, uh, what improvements can ha occur with regards to airport law enforcement. Can you expand on that a little bit? Chairman Larson, absolutely, I appreciate the question. And uh, as I mentioned in my statement, 
airport law enforcement does everything within their power and authority to hold unruly passengers accountable for their bad behavior. There, there may be situations, and I can't speak to the internal communication and coordination issues within the airline, where there may be a delay in requesting airport law enforcement assistance. Uh, but suffice it to say, airport law enforcement responds when called to carriers um, to support them in responding to unruly passenger incidents. Um, it, it just seems already to me that, uh, at least on the enforcement side, there are gaps in the communication that occurs to ensure there's law enforcement available uh, when requested. Um, but Ms. Beyer, can you talk um, from the airline's perspective on how that process works to ensure that there, um, or to increase the opportunity for law enforcement to be uh, at the gate when uh, upon landing? Sure, thank you for the question. So, um, you know, it is the, uh, the responsibility of the crew members on board when there is an incident to communicate with the airline um, and to, to make the decision that uh, the incident on board merits uh, calling law enforcement to, to greet the aircraft. Um, you know, from our side, um, you know, from a higher level, we have coordinated for many months with our airport partners, with our airport law enforcement partners, um, to understand how we can improve any communication um, and to ensure that when law enforcement is called, they have uh, the, the uh, resources and the, the time to greet the aircraft. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Andrews, I just want to um, start off by underscoring, I recognize you work for American Airlines, not, uh, well, not United, as I said in my testimony, and we'll fix that, because uh, I know you're, you're proud of your time there and apologize for that. Um, and it's really disheartening and disturbing to hear about um, to, that this incident happened to you, the one you described on the flight. What was a follow-on from that? Was there, did you feel a need to report? Did you feel a, a need to let it slide? How did, how did you want to approach it and what, what eventually happened? Thank you for that question, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> there was no need, uh, my, um, my experience or in that situation to uh, escalate it any further following our threat and error management procedures. Um, if the situation is de-escalated and brought to resolve, there is no need to contact the cockpit or to uh, bring law enforcement involved. There was not. Um, at any point, uh, uh, um, uh, on, the, on the escalation scale then, what kind of incident would require you or compel you to report that first to the cockpit and then, and then to the um, gate you're flying to? Thank you for that question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that would probably be at level two or anything higher, anything that moves to a threatening level or physical law, uh, interaction, anything becomes physical with the two. Yeah, so even threatening, we move right. on to. Thank you, thank you. My five minutes is up. I recognize Mr. Grace of Louisiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to. I want to make note. Let me. Let me. Let me say it again. I said at the beginning of my test of my opening statement. I'm going to say it again. Uh, some of the instances we've seen with unruly passengers are completely unacceptable. People need to be held fully accountable under the law. Um, but it, but I found it interesting in in that I, I want to say it again. We've got to make sure that we're looking at this entire flight experience. Why are these incidences increasing, spiking like they are? Um, I heard alcohol. I heard masks. I heard other things. 75%, 75% of the, of the air rage incidences that are occurring are tied back to mask. 75%, six are tied back to alcohol. Um, it, it, you know, one of the things that I think about, and I said this in my, in my opening, you, you, have, you have different experiences that people see, people see things like this. They, they, they see things like this happening. They, they, they see these things happening and they're, they're trying to decide, wait, what, what, is, what is the rule? Is, is there a rule? Is there exception? People, people sit down at restaurants right outside the gate to the airplane, and they're all sitting there eating and maybe close together, and, and they, don't have, they don't have masks on. Yet they come on an airplane where they've been told that it's the cleanest air ever and, and all sorts of recycling air, and they've got to put masks on. 
And so I, I, I do think that we, we've got we've to really think through this more holistically. I'll say it again, not as myopically as just looking at it. Why is this experience, uh, why is, are all these experiences tied back to masks? Well, I think it's the frustration people have, the, 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 um, uh, I think the, the conditions that, that appear to be uh, demonstrating a good bit of hypocrisy. Mr. Chairman, I, I, received a, I received a text message this morning from a guy at home, which I have no idea how he knew this hearing was happening. And he says, I want to share that I was traveling three times a month, but have almost given up air travel because the experience is so uncomfortable with the mask mandate. As long as there's a mask mandate on airplanes and airports, I'll avoid them at all costs. I know a lot of fellow travelers, travelers feel the exact same way. Um, look, I, I, I wear a mask. I wear it here. I wear it on airplanes. But, but I, I do think we've got to make sure that we're not focused on, on too small of a subset of this issue and, and make sure that we're looking a bit more, a bit more holistically. Uh, Ms. Nelson... Uh, I, I appreciate your testimony, appreciate you being back uh, b before the committee. Um, it, 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 it seems that people, as I noted, are, are, are somewhat stressed out right now, and there's a lot of anxiety, as I noted in some of the statistics earlier. Um, why do we see so many instances of flight attendants and, and, and airline employees um, escalating the, 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 the situations and some of the videos? What efforts are, are, are y'all working on to, to attempt to, to, to de-escalate the situation. And, and what I'm thinking of specifically is I know I've seen a few videos recently with some of these kids, including one that was having an asthma attack. Um, and any, any thoughts there on how, you know, I'll use that term again, that kind of how we can decompress these incidences? Uh, thank you, Mr. Garrett. Um, first of all, I just want to note that everyone is at a stress level 10. Uh, everyone needs a little bit of help, and uh, there are always exceptions. But uh, flight attendants have done an extraordinary job of de-escalating. Uh, and part of the problem with de-escalating is getting to the problem early so that you can de-escalate. You also oftentimes, if you are the initial uh, flight attendant to provide instruction and there is a conflict created, you oftentimes need to call on another member of the flight crew to try to do that de-escalation. When we have staffing levels at minimum levels, we have fewer people to be able to do that. We have fewer people to be able to identify the issues as they are occurring so that we can get to those and de-escalate them more successfully. And I, I should just note that flight attendants do this every day. Most incidents and most flights don't make it on the evening news. As you noted, these are a relatively small number of incidents. Um, but yes, we need more staffing. We also have to recognize that during the course of this pandemic, there has been conflicting information coming from leadership about what we need to do to address this public health crisis. And that is the biggest issue that we find on board. You are, you are correct. There, uh, there has not been enough enforcement in the airport um, and consistency around that. Flight attendants give instructions on board that when you are eating or drinking, you are supposed to uh, dip your mask for a short period of time, put it back up again. So there's very clear instructions on board the plane for that. When you talk about the air circulation on board, we talk about levels of safety. All of the studies that show that great uh, filtration on board is very important. But this, uh, the aircraft is not like an office environment. People are jammed in together much closer than any other space. It is recirculated air. And so the mass together with the filtration on board, together with the cleaning on board, all of these levels of safety are what keep us safe. Now, I will tell you, flight attendants every single day have to remind people. And in fact, actually, I was on a flight recently where I had to be reminded by a flight attendant put, to put my mask back up. So not every insta instance is an instance of conflict. Sometimes we have to remind that because people are forgetting. So there will be instances of that. But the more that we can keep those masks on, the more Thank that you. we're gonna keep everybody safe and we have to get through this pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. <laughs> I recognize uh, Chair DeFazio for uh, five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Nelson, uh, Mr. Bidwell said that uh, many times uh, the, uh, the affected the flight attendant or flight crew uh, will not wait around uh, to report to airport police. Can, uh, can you address that? Yes, I can. So flight attendants are scheduled quite tight 
Um, not all airlines have communicated to flight attendants that they will support them both emotionally and legally um, when these incidents occur. Um, there is a program at United Airlines um, at, that does provide this and does provide communication to flight attendants that helps them know that they will have that backing from the airline if they report these incidents to law enforcement. Um, it is a, a, a disruption in the day. There is a lot of uh, pressure on the flight attendants to get to the next flight. They know that because of minimum staffing, if they don't make the next flight, the next flight may not go out on time. And so all of these pressures are on the employee on the front lines, not to mention the fact that we, are rec we should recognize that these are the victims. These are the people who have just been punched in the face or have just been hurt in some way. And if they don't have uh, support around them right away uh, to let them know that they should report that, that they are going to be supported in reporting that, oftentimes in that state of shock, they're not in a place where they're able to make a good decision on their own without that information to make those reports. So we often find that law enforcement will blame uh, the crew. The crew is not necessarily backed up by the airline or just given good information around that. And this is an area where we can improve. I don't believe anyone is trying to do anything wrong here, but the crews don't have enough support around them and they do have plenty of pressure on them to keep moving. Uh, thank you. So. Um... Uh, Ms. Byer, I would hope that uh, your uh, member airlines would take that uh, into account uh, since FAA has asked them to look at what additional measures can be taken. Uh, Ms. Nelson specifically mentioned United having a good policy around this. Uh, I assume that not all airlines have communicated that. It's like, yeah, if you were going to be a little late for your next flight, delay the next flight because you have to report that someone punched you, um, we're going to support you. Uh, so I would hope uh, that that would be part of the recommendations uh, that would go. Um, back to um, Mr. Uh, uh, Bidwell, um, what about this to-go go alcohol stuff? Again, you know, I've been flying, doing this job for 35 years, and until this year, I never saw big to-go signs. Uh, can't the airports themselves, you're saying, oh, well, it's local laws, and you know, like in Louisiana, and you can walk down the street, and some, you know, some states, I think New Mexico stopped allowing you to get drive-in to go drinks, but um, that's only recent. So uh, couldn't the airports themselves say to the concessionaires, um, this uh, could lead to a violation of federal law, uh, we want you to stop this practice. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for the question. Although we have yet to see it, we understand the FAA has data indicating that alcohol was involved in 6% of unruly passenger incidents. And of that, we have no way of knowing whether the unruly passenger was intoxicated when they arrived at the airport. Brought I know, okay, I got that. But let's, let's say, this is new. Here it is. I was, you know, I was getting a beer and some guy asked for like three shots of vodka in a to-go cup. Uh, you know, by the time he cranks that down with whatever he drank beforehand, uh, he's going to be drunk. Uh, and yeah, maybe it's only reported at 6%. Who knows? I'm asking you a simple question. This did not occur before COVID. And why is it occurring now? And why won't you stop it? It is an inducement for people to break the law just by carrying it on board, let alone whether or not they're going to get crocked. Yes or no? To-go to alcohol was available before the pandemic in certain instances, and it is only available at a relatively few locations. And I will tell you that in order to assist airlines that are reluctant to make announcements during the boarding process, many airports have deployed signage. Other airports work with local airlines to design and institute the use of marked cups to assist airline gate agents in identifying those that contain alcohol. It's a coordinated effort, but only airline employees and specifically gate agents can deny boarding to passengers. Right, so they're gonna have to do breathalyzers. All right, thanks, uh, the answer is no. Um, to, um, again, to uh, Ms. Beyer, uh, just on the pre-flight uh, announcements. Um, uh, you know, I, I, some airlines have tougher announcements than others. Uh, I would hope, again, that will be part of the consideration that the FAA is uh, asking for, to talk a little more specifically 
uh, about, uh, about you know, the potential penalties uh, in more harsh terms. Okay, but here's a question. Um, does law prohibit the airlines from sharing their no-fly lists? I think it does, maybe, because it's collusion or something. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Um, as I mentioned, the, the internal airline no-fly lists have been a really critical tool for us in response to this issue over the past year. Um, I, I think it's important to note first, um, because there's sometimes some confusion, that uh, what we're talking about is uh, an internal airline uh, no-fly right. list. Right. I'm asking, though, can one airline share it with another? Could there be a common database uh, because someone gets banned from one airline because uh, of unruly, unacceptable behavior, they just switch to another one. So there are legal and operational challenges with airlines sharing those lists amongst one another. Okay, then how about, okay, good. All right, that's, that's a good answer. Thank you. There's a problem. Maybe we can have the FAA create a database and they can ask people to post to that and then the airlines can access it in the future. Uh, my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Massey of Kentucky for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Larson. Thanks for having this hearing. You know, no passenger should ever be violent or disrespectful to a flight attendant or a member of the crew of an aircraft. Everybody has a bad day now and then, and I always try to give somebody the benefit of the doubt uh, when I see stern words being exchanged between a passenger and a flight attendant. I'm thinking one of them's having a bad day. This is a stressful situation and just try to give people the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I would suggest, and, and I'm not really going to direct my statements to the witnesses so much as my colleagues on this panel and also the broader membership of the house, I would suggest that we put these flight attendants and flight crews in a very difficult situation. And there's some things that we might be able to do to alleviate that. For instance, we, we live in a republic where we elect representatives and they pass the laws. The reason we have it that way is if there were just one person or one nameless uh, agency or bureaucracy that were promulgating these rules for us to live by, we, we have no way to address our grievances. And if the People's House would actually vote on these regulations, now I don't agree with the, the mask regulations and I'll get into that later, but if we would vote on these things, they would have the imprimatur of the support of the people, if the people's house would weigh in. But when people sit down in their aircraft to take their flight and they hear a public service announcement that says federal law states, even myself, I'm wondering, well, when was that federal law passed? The reality is there's never been a federal law passed. Yes, there are laws that you need to comply with the, the flight attendant, and yes, there's been an executive order, but the problem with that is what our founders realized long ago, unless you have the buy-in of the people, it's going to be hard to get people to comply with rules. And so I think a breakdown of our institutions, our governmental institutions, is leading to this breakdown of society and, and, and civil uh, politeness to each other. And I, so I would suggest that instead of wringing our hands and just having a hearing and listening to this, that we actually weigh in instead of deferring everything to the executive branch and to people who aren't elected to make the rules. And in the long run, I think it would be more helpful to our flight attendants and the, and the flight crews, and we could all have a better experience. Now, let me get to some another thing that I think is leading to these problems, and the ranking member touched on it, the, the science is uh, is very lightly presented here. I mean, what if in the pocket in front of you, instead of just instructions for exiting the aircraft, were directions for uh, wearing a mask and also the science that shows whether the cloth mask is, to what degree a cloth mask is less effective than an N95. I mean, people, they're sort of, they're catching on. They're not all scientists and engineers. But the cloth mask is the only medical device or personal safety equipment in the United States that is required for which there is no specification, for which there is no regulation. People start to wonder, well, if these worked, wouldn't there be a specification on them? And which ones work better than others? The, the science is not being presented here. If we could persuade people, 
of what is effective instead of trying to force them. And then the, as the ranking member pointed out, we see instances of our officials, the Speaker of the House, going to close, tightly packed fundraisers and not wearing the mask or other people within the government who are on the planes and leave their mask off for an extended period of time. That doesn't help either. So let me just close by saying this. I do not support vaccine mandates. I do not support mask mandates. I'm not saying they're not effective, but if we want to help out here, there needs to be a persuasion campaign, not a coercion campaign. And it's not fair to put the flight attendants in the middle of this. Some of it has become political, but we, we put them in the middle of a situation that's a no-win situation. And uh, I'll just close with that and say, let's get back to the science. Let's get back to being reasonable and civil with each other. And let's get back to the job of legislating instead of wringing our hands because some administrative agency, which by the way, we have the authority over because they're do, they've done something or aren't doing something we don't agree with, but we haven't given them the instructions on what to do. With that I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. I now turn to Representative Cohen of Tennessee. You recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank all of our witnesses. Uh, for Mr. Andrews, I want to say that uh, the behavior that you experienced was unacceptable and there's no excuse for it. I don't care if people are upset because they have to wear masks. I don't care if uh, they have higher stress. Uh, they, that, that, that behavior was totally unacceptable, inexcusable, and uh, it was wrong. Um, this question goes out to anybody that can give me an answer. Has there been any, I guess I'll start with, with Ms. Nelson, has there been any analysis of the uh, demographics of the people who have been uh, involved in this uh, outrageous behavior? Not that I'm aware of, Mr. Cohen. Anybody else, any have any knowledge of any uh, demographics on race, age, uh, residence, uh, Anything at all? What, what I will tell you is that from our survey results, many of these uh, incidents uh, were uh, more likely happening out of places where there has been uh, a real inconsistent communication and uh, very clear um, opposition to uh, masks and to dealing with this uh, public health emergency in a mobilized way. Uh, to, can you be more specific? Are you saying that the the airports have been less, or are they the region? Uh, I'm, I'm being specific to the region, and obviously the airports are located in those regions. Um, we so are you saying basically uh, the Southeastern Conference region? Uh, <laughs> um, we, have, we have had uh, a lot of incidents out of Charlotte. We have had a lot of incidents out of the Florida airports and out of Texas. And I'm not saying that there aren't incidents in other places at all. Um, but there seems to be a higher con concentration. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. That's kind of what I suspected. And I would, uh, I would comment in Charlotte, which I have been through on occasion, uh, there is, I, I think it's gate A. It's the one, the furthest one out when you have to go to the terminal and go through it and you're over on the side where they sell the pizza and the nice kind of area, which is Chick-fil-A side. And then you go out the other way all the way to the end. They will stop serving food uh, out there, uh, give or take six or seven o'clock. I think it's somewhere around there. They won't. The food places are closed down, but the alcohol places stay open, and I know they stay open at least until the last flight is out. Uh, to the gentleman that uh, Mr. Bidwell, you represent the airports, do you not? Yes, sir, I do. Why in the hell would they not give you food, but they'll give you alcohol? Congressman, I, I, I don't know what exactly uh, is, is the policy for the concessionaires at uh, Gate A at, at Charlotte International Airport. Yeah, well, it might be profit margin. It might be they don't give a hoot, uh, but the, the, the areas where they sell the alcohol are packed and the people are fairly rowdy. They do have some type of like little, you know, pork rinds or something like that, a uh, real gourmet area. And uh, I like pork rinds, but neither here nor there. Uh, they, uh, uh, but they close the food. 
they close the food down, but the alcohol is in abundance. Um, this is behavior is, is just wrong. I, I, had, I had to raise the issue early on in March of 2020 uh, with the airlines to start enforcing masks. Because I was on planes where the flight attendants didn't wear masks and there was no requirement for anybody to wear, but the, 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 flight, the flight attendants were not wearing masks either. Uh, and, and that's just wrong, and it just, we need to get beyond that. Uh, Mr. Andrews, I agree with all of your suggestions, and that's very helpful, your 11 suggestions. Uh, would any of them really cost any money for the airlines and the airports to do that? Thank you for that question, Mr. Cohen. Um, while I'm not an expert, um, I certainly um, would suggest that possibly uh, if there are fines that some of these passengers are subjected to, that possibly some of those uh, fees or things can be um, they paid can be, for. They can use it, right. Thank you. Yes. Let me just relate my anecdotal. When I left D.C. the week of the insurrection, there were lots of people in the airport that did not have their masks on, and that's the air, airport's fault. And when they got on the plane and they tried to hand them a little uh, ointment to wipe their hands, they objected and tossed it back to them. Almost time expired. That was the Southeastern Conference crowd. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. I uh, recognize Mr. Perry of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Nelson, I just noted in your testimony that you stated, and I quote, I know there is not one person on this aviation subcommittee that thinks the combative, abusive, defiant, and violent behavior on our planes and in our airports is acceptable, unquote. I, I couldn't agree more, and I don't think there is a person on this committee that could agree more with you. Um, so I, I, I'm just gonna give you a statement and see if you agree with this then. No American should be subject to combative, abusive, defiant, and violent behavior in the workplace, and such behavior should be universally condemned and subjected to the full extent of the law, regardless of the perpetrator. Is that something you can, you can stand with, something you could agree with, Ms. Nelson? 100%, 100 and I appreciate you raising these issues because mm -hmm. I believe that this hearing is an opportunity for us to identify issues where we can all work together That's great. to make this hey, better. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate your response. Um, I'd like to talk to you and address the issue of union violence and some statements that you made um, and to provide some context to the committee here and everyone else, in 1969, the seminal study on union violence in America by Phil Taft and Philip Ross noted the United States has had the bloodiest and most violent labor history of any industrial nation in the world. Now, unfortunately, the bloodshed and violence at the hands of unions has continued at a disturbing rate. Since 1975, there's been nearly 12,000 incidents of union violence reported by the media including the murder of 203 Americans, according to the National Institute for Labor Relations Research. And those are just incidents reported by the media. I mean, the rate of union violence in America is staggering and should be received with universal condemnation by every single American, regardless of your affiliation. Now, unfortunately and strangely, the Supreme Court prohibits federal prosecution of such violence if it's in pursuit of a legitimate union objective which in, if, you, if you take Chairman DeFazio's statement, I would say is an inducement to break the law and commit union violence. Ma'am, in an interview with Splinter, View, Splinter News, you stated it's important to put out their clear militant line and have it be centered around the workers and what they're willing to do. I've said sometimes you have to beat it out of them. Sometimes they just have to remember the beating they'll take, unquote. That's, that's what you said. You also said the law doesn't reflect moral clarity or conscience. It doesn't recognize the power of working people. But the truth is, the truth is there are no illegal strikes, only unsuccessful ones, unquote. And then further, in July of this year, and I'm just going to abbreviate the terminology for respect here, F. Taft-Hartley, F. Taft-Hartley. A general strike doesn't likely 
A general strike likely doesn't work without unions, and just because it's a law doesn't mean it's just, unquote. To me, these seem like explicit calls for violence and militancy, claims that strikes are only illegal if they fail, and repeated calls for illegal general strikes demonstrates a flagrant disregard for property, life, and the rule of law. And so I'm just wondering if you are interested in maybe recanting any of these statements, and if you would agree that a zero tolerance regarding union violence would be appropriate, because I agree with you that zero tolerance regarding violence on an airplane is, is, the, is the standard we ought to strive. So, so where do you stand on zero tolerance regarding union violence? I don't know what you're talking about with union violence. I know that the labor movement pushes uh, peaceful, um, uh, peaceful civil disobedience. I know that the mine workers who are in the sign right behind me right here, 1,100 mine workers on strike right now in Alabama have been peacefully demonstrating. They have been hit five times. Uh, well, Ma'am, I, I just read management. your statements. Those are your statements. I, I, wanna be, I wanna be very clear. I wanna be very clear. My friend, Paul Hartshorn, is behind here, here right now. He died on the job. There were many people who died on the job. There are poultry workers who were slammed into- Ma'am, that's great. I'm talking about union violence. I grew up in a time in Pennsylvania where- Ma'am, it's my time. Workers. I grew up a time in Pennsylvania where Yaka Blonsky was killed by a union rival. He and his wife and his daughter were killed. I grew up in a time just last year and the year before in, in South Central Pennsylvania, the IBEW got a presentment for being the thugs, the helpful union guys for force, violence, and threats of violence. Will you renounce that or won't you? Let me be very clear. I guess you won't. The labor, the, let me be very clear. The labor movement is for peaceful protest, not violence. Thank you. The and we are against time, violence you. against the workers. The, thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I recognize Representative Davids for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, very briefly, I'll just say that uh, I appreciate the uh, recognition by uh, the folks on here who have shown up to uh, speak on behalf of their union members, um, that the work that you all do is uh, appreciated. And uh, as a daughter of a union steward, I would just like to um, recognize that uh, when folks go on strike uh, and they do it peacefully, which is exactly what we were just hearing about, um, it can lead to some very positive change. And so I just wanna express my appreciation for, uh, for that. And then I will yield my time to uh, Chairman DeFazio. I uh, thank the Don't gentle lady. Um, Ms. Nelson, uh, I think it would be uh, helpful uh, to respond to uh, Mr. Perry's statements. I guess he missed things like the Pullman strike and other uh, uh, slaughters of uh, union organizers attempting just to have a decent living and a decent life. So I would um, yield you time to uh, respond if you would like. The Walter Ruther brothers were beaten on an overpass but near Detroit. They were um, assaulted for uh, trying to fight for health care, a decent living, um, the ability for workers to go into a workspace without losing limbs. Um, because they are pushed so hard against machinery that um, they, they can't compete with with their human bodies. Uh, the Ludlow strikers were gunned down and burned to death when they were striking in tents, uh, pushed out of company housing. Um, there were workers who were disrespected um, and the mules that were carrying the coal out of the mines were more uh, important than the workers. This past year, for the past 18 months, we saw that workers were treated as disposable. The strikes and the actions in return have been about safety. They have been about improving the safety for consumers and certainly as flight attendants, as pilots, as anyone working in aviation, we take very, very personally when any blood is shed. And we said during the government shutdown that our workspace was becoming increasingly unsafe as we had 35 days of people not going with a paycheck, people who are like air traffic controllers who have to go into their workspace. And if they make a mistake, it's an aircraft accident. So they have to put all distractions aside. What could be more distracting than not getting a paycheck and not knowing how you're gonna be able to provide for your families? 
So the, I, I, I wanna be very clear that the violence perpetrated against workers has been nonstop and has been persistent. And the unions have organized against that and they have organized against that both for workers' rights, but all, and sometimes just to enforce the laws that already exist, um, but also to make sure that consumers and other people who are in our space, who we are serving, who are dedicated and went to work on the front lines throughout this pandemic with risk to ourselves and our families. And we lost our lives. Some people, um, as, as Teddy said, went through horrible conditions because of it. And some people are suffering long-term effects of COVID. And so these are the things that we fight against. This is why we're here. We are dedicated to safety. We're dedicated to the people who are in our care. And the actions that we take are to keep everyone safe. Uh, I thank you uh, for that statement. You know, um, you know I, I, the uh, reconstructive history of Mr. Perry was absolutely quite extraordinary, having studied uh, labor history. So uh, I won't comment any further because it was so bizarre and absurd. Uh, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back to Ms. Davids. Ms. Davids yield back the rest of her time. I yield back. Thank you. Um, Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Burchett, Tennessee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always tough to follow my colleague from Tennessee, Representative former Senator Cohen, my dear friend, who my mama would always say, I just love that Steve Cohen, but that gum, honey, sometimes I just want to smack his little fat jaws. So, but he is my dear friend. He called my mama uh, when my daddy died. So I'm, I'm kind of partial to my buddy Steve Cohen. I know that that hurts him in his district and hurts me in my district, but that's just the way it is. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you letting me speak. I recently heard a story about a mama and her two-year-old son being removed from a plane because her son was suffering from an asthma attack and couldn't keep his mask on. A spokesman for the airline said after the fact that exemptions to the face covering requirements may be granted to individuals with disabilities who make a request to our special assistant team at least 72 hours prior to the departure. And, uh, you know, I understand your all's point for better communication with passengers on mask mandates before boarding, but what kind of efforts are airlines actually making to ensure that the parents of children with disabilities similarly receive advance notice of available medical exemptions? I've been flying a whole lot like everybody up here has, and I've never heard of any of this. One of y'all could answer that, please. Congressman, I'd be happy to, to answer your question. Um, the airlines have done many things uh, since mandate was first implemented and gave very specific uh, instructions and directions to the airlines for what was permissible in terms of exemptions to the mask mandate. Um, and those things include very clear communications, um, what requirements are uh, at the time of booking, at check-in, and throughout that uh, individual's uh, uh, air travel journey. I'm aware of the specifics of the, the case that you're referring to. But what I would say is that each of the individual airlines, uh, per the U.S. government requirements, have individual processes uh, for uh, individuals to apply for those exemptions. And um, I, I do know that the majority of those exemptions that are granted are given to uh, younger children with uh, cognitive or other disabilities. Okay, well, this is a two-year-old. You might want to look it up. It's... Um... Chaya, C-H-A-Y-A, uh, Bruck was the mama, and um, it was her two-year-old child, Dina, that this involved. I'd like to know, too, I'm, I'm off the, on the plane, and they announce that it is federal law that we have to wear a mask. Could somebody please direct me to the code where that is, in fact, the federal law that you have to wear a mask? Or is this a law that we've, um, or a rule that we've designated to the FF? FAA to, in fact, enforce, but yet we have not put it on paper. I'm curious. So, Congressman, I'm happy to take that as well. Uh, the, the transportation uh, federal mask mandate is a regulation imposed on airlines and airports, transportation uh, non-aviation partners. Mm -hmm. 
um, through an order of the uh, CDC, um, as well as a security directive issued by the Transportation Security Administration. But is that in fact the law? You, you state, they state very clearly over the microphone, I suspect it would be time you could be informing folks that have disabled children of what they need to do. You tell us that it is in fact a federal law that you have to wear a mask. I would defer to my um, federal agency counterparts about the underlying statutory authority, um, but it is indeed a federal requirement that is imposed on the operators of transportation. Okay. Mr. Bedwell, uh, you mentioned that airport law enforcement should be provided the flexibility to prioritize the response to unruly passenger in incidents. Can you be a little more specific on what these flexibilities are and what, the chi what you have in mind? Thank you, Con Congressman Burchett. Yes, um, airport law enforcement has a number of competing requirements when they're called upon to respond when called by an airline. Um, it can be for an unruly passenger incident, it could be for a mask related incident, or it could be for some other related activity. And by regulation, they are compelled to respond to the gate when, when called by the airlines. But um, our recommendation is that airport law enforcement be the discretion to prioritize the response to unruly passenger incidents over mask related incidents or other other incidents. Okay, thank you. And I yield take precedence, of course. I yield the remain my last three seconds to uh, Representative Cohen. <laughs> God bless uh, your mouth. Uh, the chair recognizes Representative Williams of uh, Georgia for five minutes. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Chair Larson, for holding this important hearing today. And thank you to all of the witnesses for testifying um, and being here in what I did not anticipate being a hostile witness situation. Y'all, my district is home to Hartsville Jackson International Airport, our nation's busiest and most efficient airport. Many of the people that you'll see working there are my constituents. And these folks help so many of us like me get to work every week here in DC and help us travel across our country and our world. And they prioritize passenger safety in their work every single day. It's personal to me that here in Congress that we prioritize their safety as well. I'm dedicated to protecting my constituents from verbal and physical abuse and disruption as they continue to do their jobs and serve our travelers. Today's hearing will help us best prevent and respond to rising cases of air rage. Ms. Nelson, Chair DeFazio touched on this earlier, but I wanna go deeper into this conversation. In your testimony, you mentioned an abusive passenger can be banned from one airline, but can then jump on another carrier. You also recommend creating a database for airlines to share information that will prevent this. So could you go into detail on what obstacles currently exist for this kind of information sharing across airlines and tell us any specific recommendations for Congress or regulators to help remove the barriers to information sharing that will benefit airports, airlines, workers, and passengers alike? Thank you very much for that question. Um, yes, we had an incident where uh, one regional carrier was providing service for a mainline carrier. So this was not, this in the passenger's eyes was the same uh, airline actually. And an incident uh, occurred on board a flight, attacked a crew. Um, the passenger was banned uh, from that airline uh, after the fact that the passenger um, got off the flight, uh, went on to their next flight and continued to be a problem on the next flight uh, performing for a different carrier. So if, if we simply have a coordination that can be coordinated from the FAA, uh, Chairman DeFazio was referring to this earlier, um, there are potentially some issues to work through in terms of how this information is shared. Um, it is my understanding that uh, the through the contract of carriage, um, the airlines already have the ability to share this uh, for safety reasons. And there could be a coordination through the FAA where airlines are in real time sharing that information about problem passengers so that other airlines can be flagged and that can be flagged in their system so that they can identify that and assess the conditions and take appropriate actions at their, at their airline as well. 
Thank you, Ms. Nelson. You also mentioned in your testimony that 71% of flight attendants who filed incident reports did not get follow-up. Could you provide some best practices for a process of following up on incident reports and how important it is that this kind of process not only address the incident itself, but also ensure that workers know that steps are being taken for their safety? Yes, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I, I do not believe that it, it means that 71% of the time that the airlines are not taking action. Um, the importance of following back up with crew to let them know that action was taken is very important for backup of that crew because the next time they go to their flight and they are abused or, um, or attacked or experience another one of these incidents, they are less likely if they believe that nothing is going to happen to report it. So we have a break in the safety chain there. And then also, it is possible that they are hesitant to even take action to enforce safety compliance, which uh, leads to an unsafe condition uh, because they don't believe that they have that backup. So um, simply uh, having the staff, and, and I will say this is a challenge um, in this era of coronavirus, everyone has cut back, but having a process at each airline where there is a simple follow-up to those reports that they have been received, they are being acted on. In not every case can the flight attendants be given all the actions that are taken, but letting them know that their report was received and being acted on is going to help facilitate better safety on board because that crew member then goes back to do their job as they're required to do and doesn't have any hesitancy in doing it. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Andrews, for sharing your testimony today. Thank you especially for sharing an incident that I know couldn't be easy to talk about. The racism and rage that you endured are unacceptable. And I wanna be sure that we can do all we can to stop air rage incidents before they occur so that dedicated airline industry workers like yourself can do the jobs that you love to do. Of the recommendations in your testimony to protect workers from unruly passengers, which, which would make the biggest and most immediate impact in preventing incidents of air rage? I'm, I'm, and this, I am out this, of this time. The chair, and yeah, so. Andrew, if you could get that answer to me, because I would love to find some immediate impacts that we can do in this committee to help keep everyone safe in our air. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. We'll take that question for the record, please. And then uh, the chair now recognizes Representative Nels of Texas for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. The American people want to feel safe and secure when flying, and it is important to provide those same protections to airline employees. I thank all the witnesses for being here and appreciate what you do each and every day. However, I am discouraged by the fact this committee hearing does not have witnesses from agencies that are charged with protecting airline passengers and their employees, the FAA, TSA, DOJ, FBI, they're all absent. And this makes no sense to me. It is unfortunate our airline employees are facing difficult times. It is unfortunate flight attendants are tasked with enforcing mandatory mask mandates on children two years old. It is unfortunate flight attendants are required to patrol up and down the aisles ensuring small children are complying with these mask mandates. And it is unfortunate these same flight attendants are tasked with reporting these children and their families to authorities. It is also unfortunate these families, after explaining to the flight attendant that their child suffers from anxiety, or are autistic or suffers from asthma, which places that child in an unnecessary health risk, will be forcibly removed if necessary from that flight. I was not refusing a mask, nor did I even say I wouldn't try to keep a mask on my son. We were escorted off the plane as I was holding a mask over his little face. I genuinely don't have words. And quite honestly, I wouldn't know what to say to that mother. It is important to note this administration is flying illegal immigrants around our country on commercial airlines using taxpayer dollars with many of them not tested for COVID-19. The hypocrisy of this administration may be a contributing factor to increase tension on our airline employees. 
Testimony of one witness today stated 75% of reports related to unruly passengers are related to mask noncompliance. I would like to see that data as to how many of those reports were related to families with small children. But of course, without having representatives from the FAA here, I don't believe I will receive an answer. But I do have a question for you, Ms. Beyer. Uh, in your testimony, you stated the fed that federal cooperation will be critical to fighting air rage. What actions taken by the federal government have been most effective so far at helping the airlines maintain safety and security in regards to air rage? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, I think it's been stated many times that we all have a role to play in addressing these issues, both the United States government and the industry. In terms of specifically what the government has done that has been helpful to our efforts, um, we do applaud the Federal Aviation Administration for their efforts with the zero tolerance policy for maintaining that policy, um, but also in particular, uh, for uh, the transparency in publicizing the outcomes of the cases that they have adjudicated and, and also publicizing the penalties involved. We think that that is a strong deterrent to, uh, to future uh, misbehavior incidents. Um, and back to what Ms. Nelson had, had um, uh, offered earlier on that feedback loop to industry about what happens with those cases. It's extremely helpful to the airlines so that we can continue adjust um, our policies and approaches to deal with these issues, um, but also to ensure that we have the information to provide to our employees about what is being done after an incident occurs. Thank you, uh, Ms. Beyer, uh, for your answer. And I think that it would be very helpful to the airline industry and all of its employees if this administration would actually comply with some of the rules and regulations they want everyone else to follow. You can see behind me with good old Mr. Kerry here and a bunch of crazies from Texas flying to DC, leaving Texas, doing their job, leaving Texas, flying up to Washington, DC. Do you see any of them with masks on? Where is the outrage from the airlines there? Where is the outrage from the administration? I hope we give these individuals fines. Are we fining them? I don't think so. It's, a dis it's an outrage, quite honestly. Thank you for being here. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Johnson of Georgia for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and thank you to the witnesses for your time and testimony. Rage has become the defining emotion of our times and we witnessed rage from Trump and members of Congress when Trump lost the election. The flying public was pummeled with false claims that the election was stolen. And we all witnessed the rage against Congress spurred on by those same leaders who instigated the infamous insurrection on January 6th. These are the same leaders who spread the other big lie that the COVID-19 pandemic is a fraud. You can't believe Dr. Fauci and that Democrats are taking away your personal freedom with mask mandates. As a result, people are angry and confused. They get on flights and they let out their rage after having seen their leaders refuse to follow the rules. They have seen belligerence from the nation's highest leaders become acceptable behavior. So if the leaders can do it and get away with it, they think it's okay for them to do the same thing. So when they get to the airport, folks feel like they can say and do anything they want because they have been misled into believing that their personal freedom trumps, pun intended, their responsibility to their fellow man or for the common good. Then politicians blame air flight rage on hypocrisy of those who take off their masks to eat at airport restaurants. Unbelievable. Rage is emboldened by the careless and ill thought out actions of leaders who insist the pandemic is unreal and who eschew public health safety measures. Rage in the skies is one of the unfortunate but predictable results. Mr. Andrews, misinformation touted by some public officials is feeding societal distrust and anger towards CDC regulations. 
What's worse, too many Americans buy into this misinformation, resulting in a lack of consensus in scientific fact and an erosion of civility in our national discourse. Can you please speak to how important it is that state, local, and national leaders role model best practices for public health and safety and how essential that signaling is to prevent folks from behaving in a reckless and aggressive manner? Thank you for that question, sir. I, I would agree totally that um, there are mixed messages out there and that is confusing to the public and at times makes it very difficult for flight attendants to do our jobs effectively or challenged to do our job. They leave from uh, one state to another state, from one city to another city, where they hear messages from leadership in their particular city or state. They come aboard the aircraft and we carry passengers from state to state, city to city. And it's very confusing and can be very frustrating at times um, and make our jobs much more difficult. So having clear messaging, um, scientific messaging that's accurate would um, help all of us. Thank you, and I applaud and admire your professionalism as you maintain your cool while under attack. The blatantly racist, sexist, and homophobic character of airplane rage is alarming. Is there a need, sir, to elevate the safety concerns of Black Americans and flight attendants of color? And Ms. Nelson, uh, anger and violence are disproportionately targeted towards female flight attendants, and we've heard that crew members are oftentimes reticent to file charges against an assault. How can Congress support crew members, especially women, so that they feel empowered to file charges against assaults on, fight, on flights? And uh, starting with you, please, uh, uh, Mr. Andrews. If you Thank take you for 30 that. seconds or less and leave Thank some for time for Mr. Andrews. Thank you for that question. Uh, um, it's no uh, mistake or no unknown fact that flight attendants of color have been disparaged on numerous occasions. And um, I think that there would be um, helpful and necessary steps to uh, better those so that it's not happening as frequently as it is. Okay, thank you. Ms. Andrews? Uh, but, uh, Congressman Johnson, um, I, I believe you're referring to me, uh, Sarah Nelson. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Nelson. That's all, that's all right. Um, I think um, clarity about what we expect, um, absolute respect among each other. I, I, I do wanna note that all of the witnesses here today and all of the representatives across the industry have worked very closely together. Unions, companies, uh, airports, airlines, we have worked closely together during this pandemic. And frankly, we have fared better because of that. But when we had the backing from the federal government about the actions that we were taking to keep everyone safe, that made all of us safer. Up. And it made it and ma and it made it possible actually for flight attendants to feel more empowered to uh, report these events, regardless of the way that they have been dismissed uh, or disposed of before, based on gender um, or love or or their race. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Thank you. The chair recognizes uh, Representative Katko of New York for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. And uh, you know, prior to coming to Congress, I was. Uh, federal organized crime prosecutor for 20 years. And uh, I have an immense amount of respect for the rule of law. And what I'm hearing today from both sides is uh, not so much a focus on that as it is trying to blame someone. The bottom line is the problem on airplanes is very troubling. The problem on airplanes is very real. And it's not a democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a political issue. I do believe it's just a general disrespect for the rule of law that permeates many aspects of our society today. And unless we enforce the rule of law, we are, we're gonna to continue to have these types of problems. So I strongly urge my colleagues on the committee and my colleagues in Congress to help the airline industry enforce the rules of law on this. And it's not about masks, it's not about individual freedoms, it's not about arrogance, it's not about catching, catching someone with their mask off, it's about enforcing the rule of law and enforcing it uniformly across the, across the way. And so, you know, I'm on, when I first came into Congress, uh, I spent a lot of time with TSA, 
uh, as chairman of the subcommittee overseeing TSA and now as ranking member, uh, it, the rule of law is an issue I take very seriously. And one of the things I'm concerned about with respect to airline safety, and something we've worked very hard on in Homeland Security, is what is gonna be the impact of airline safety uh, with the new developments in Afghanistan and uh, the potential for uh, Al-Qaeda and other nefarious groups there that want to do harm to the United States. And what impact does that have on uh, the airline industry again? And what concerns does that generate for you all? Especially when you look at it through the prism of this complete misbehavior on airplanes and airlines today. I've, had concern, I've heard concerns directly from stakeholders in the aviation community that facing these threats at the same time could amount to a perfect storm, jeopardizing the safety of our aviation workers and travelers, as well as our national security. So with this in mind, I'd like to hear from the panel about how their organizations perceive these threats. And I'm particularly interested in how unruly passengers may have disrupted basic security operations or required the, the diversion of resources, more importantly, that are typically intended to address major systemic threats such as terrorist activities. For example, I know that the air marshals uh, have to spend an extraordinary amount of time dealing with this misbehavior, and maybe, maybe we'll miss at some point some signs they should have seen of people that are really intending to do an awful lot of harm to, to, uh, to American people in general. So with that as an overview, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Byer uh, first if you could give me your thoughts on this. Sure, thank you, Congressman. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you um, as well. So, um, I mean, the, the short answer is from a, from a 10,000 foot perspective that unfortunately as an industry, um, we are used to facing uh, a number of different threats all at the same time. Um, it, it doesn't make it any easier. We certainly um, are, have been extremely concerned as I voiced already throughout this past year that um, these unruly passenger incidents not only threaten the safety of everyone on board, uh, but as has been noted, can be um, a distraction uh, uh, on board the aircraft. In terms of the threats, um, whether it is the evolving situation in Afghanistan or anywhere else in the world, um, we are constantly evaluating how those threats are evolving um, in concert with the government partners so that we understand um, those, those direct or indirect threats and that we can quickly respond um, with any additional measures that, that may be necessary. In addition to our uh, coordination with the government so that we understand those threats, we also rely on our own independent resources um, in all the places in which we operate around the world so that we have a good picture of all of the threats that we may be faced with. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to weigh in on this issue? We have about a minute left. Congressman Katko, I want to thank you very much for your partnership and your very clear focus on aviation security. Um, you've been um, absolutely wonderful to work with, and um, you are right to recognize that after 9-11, uh, we put in place emergency orders to keep all of us safe. And uh, you are very right to recognize also that these disturbances on the, air, on the airplane and the um, number of them are distracting us from the issue uh, that we have been going to work with for the past 20 years, recognizing that there is and will continue to be a threat against commercial aviation, um, the worst of which would be uh, using our commercial uh, jets, again, as weapons. Uh, we need the secondary barriers installed, as you have supported, and we need to focus on this. But these distractions on board do nothing to help us address what uh, uh, Ms. Byer was just referring to in the constant evolving uh, nature of the threats and addressing the fact that we have several threats going on at, at, the at the same time, having the best communication to the crews to be able to address that and staying focused on that and everyone able to do their job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you back. Thank you, folks, for your testimony. Thank you. The chair recognizes uh, Ms. Holmes Norton of Washington, D.C. for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for this important hearing. Uh, my first question is to Ms. Nelson. Um, it's not as if there had been no recognition of the presence of unruly passengers, and yet we're having to hold this hearing uh, this morning. I, I took note of the fact that the FAA administrator, Steve Dixon, had issued an order enforcing 
whatever that means, a zero tolerance policy against violent or threatening passengers. So I have to ask you, how consistently is this zero tolerance policy enforced? How is it enforced? Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Holmes Norton. Uh, appreciate your support. And um, you, of course, were a part of working with our union uh, almost two decades ago to put in place penalties for uh, interfering with flight crews, penalties both in terms of jail time and fines. The FAA has in the past addressed these issues as they come, uh, is sometimes issuing warnings to people. When FAA Administrator Steve Dixon announced that there would be a zero tolerance policy on January 13th, he was recognizing that there was a new threat here that we were just discussing with Mr. Katko. And, um, that, and, and that needed to be clearly communicated that the FAA would not be offering any warnings, but would be taking action directly on any of these occurrences. Now, we need, we need to staff up. We need to have more time to deal with that for the investigators who are dealing with it. So on the enforcement side, there's more that we could do to support the FAA's work in that. And we also need DOJ to take their role um, more aggressively on enforcing the criminal prosecutions around that. Um, but the zero tolerance policy is one that says that there will not be a second chance. Every single report that is received, and they are addressing this now in a priority order. It used to be first in, first out, but they're taking it priority order, so the severity of the case first. Um, that those are being addressed immediately, and there is no consideration of a warning to those passengers. There will be action taken once enough, enough evidence is um, uh, is is uh, received uh, to be able to take that action. Is DOJ prosecuting? DOJ, to my knowledge, has only prosecuted one case at this point. There are many cases that DOJ could take up, and we need DOJ to take more aggressive action. Um, it, and as you know, and as you have heard, alcohol has been a major contributor. Uh, we believe that when people start to actually face jail time, there's going to be a lot of sobering up around the country. And we will not have these bad actors, who are a few among the millions who travel every day, uh, disrupting the safety and security of everyone else. I would ask the chairman to uh, indicate to the Department of Justice that uh, a deterrent, deterrent policy is very much needed. If we could ramp up prosecutions, I think it would have an effect. Very uh, much. Ms. Beyer, um, uh, I, I'd be interested in knowing what factors influence an airline's decision to place an unruly passenger on an internal no-fly list. Is that passenger notified? Uh, I'd be very interested in how one gets on that list. Ms. Byer. Certainly, Congresswoman. Uh, so the internal airline no-fly lists um, were created as a mechanism for airlines um, to handle uh, individual cases of passengers um, pre-pandemic, and it's, it's really just come into the spotlight uh, post-pandemic. Uh, primarily, they have been used as a mechanism to prevent further travel of that individual for um, egregious mask violations um, and certainly uh, for unruly passengers. Each airline has their own internal process. Um, once a report is received from crew members um, for, for conducting their own investigations to determine the details and specifics of that case uh, before making a final determination um, that the criteria has been met to add them to that list. And I, I know that um, a number of my member airlines have publicly shared on numerous occasions how many uh, individuals, unfortunately, have already been added to those lists just this year. Um, could, could, I, could I ask uh, Mr. Bidwell, in, in your testimony, you- no, the, the gentleman's time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair recognizes Representative Balderson of Ohio for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I thank uh, everyone here uh, this morning and, and, and all that you do in the airline industry and making sure that uh, we're all taken care of and, and, and all the people across America. And I'm, I really apologize for what's been going on and 
of what you're having to deal with. I'm gonna kind of go a little bit different direction though um, and, and talk about some of the staffing and how that might've been impacted. We, we know that uh, staffing levels across the, the country and the aviation industry itself uh, has, is, has, have you all seen any changes in that staffing levels? Uh, and that can be directed to Mrs. Byer, but uh, Ms. Nelson and Mr. Andrews, you are more than welcome to comment on that also. Thank you, Congressman. I, I'm happy to start. Um, certainly, the the you know I don't need to tell this committee that the uh, pandemic had a, a huge impact on um, the airline industry um, and our staffing levels. Um, again, you know we're extremely grateful for the multiple um, rounds of support through the payroll support program to ensure that we could keep um, all of the employees who um, who wanted to um, remain with our companies um, on payroll um, and ready to serve the traveling public. Um, we, you know, we have focused um, specifically on the unruly passenger issues uh, throughout this year to ensure that we have appropriate staffing. This is one of the best practices that we've been talking about, ensuring things like having um, additional supervisors or airline security personnel uh, who are available to respond um, to the gates when there is an incident. And it's something that we continue to evaluate. Mr. Balderson, I'll, I'll just add to that to um, say that we have two different issues of staffing. Of course, the what you recognize has happened during the pandemic, uh, which Ms. Byer referred to. Uh, we kept people in their jobs and connected to their cert, uh, certifications and security credentials, but there was a lapse in funding from October 1st to the end of December. And so this summer, we saw some of the hangover of that because as you people have people out of their jobs, and I should say it wasn't just the involuntary voluntary furloughs, it was also the voluntary requests for furlough that airlines across the industry requested. Getting those people back into training and getting those certifications back in place takes time. And in fact, uh, we're almost just now getting through, uh, getting everyone back on staff. Separately, prior to the pandemic, staffing at the gates and on the planes were cut down to minimum staffing. And so we are still at those minimum staffing levels and it does make it very difficult. I wanna applaud this Congress for putting TSA on the general schedule, because as we know, some of the staffing problems are about being able to tr attract people to the jobs. And so increasing that pay and addressing those benefits and those collective bargaining agreements will make the jobs more attractive for people to come to. Finally, I would just note that the concessionaires uh, had a very difficult time at the airports and they are not all back up and running. We don't have all the staff there. And one of the issues that we have is very long lines at uh, places where people are trying to get food in the airport. Crews have a difficult time getting uh, food. And um, so staffing up across the airport is an issue and also uh, reduces the number of people with eyes and ears to be able to remind people on those masks and 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 do this in a, in a de-escalating, uh, non-confrontational way so that we can have consistent messaging across the board. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Nelson. That was great. Mr. Andrews, would you like to add anything? Yeah. Thank you for that question and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I too uh, saw a very significant impact to us um, and thank you for the payroll support um, program that did allow a lot of our flight attendants to still keep our jobs. Um, and the summer was very challenging. We have seen an uptick with a lot of flight attendants being able to come back with here at American Airlines, I think we brought our last, um, the last uh, set of flight attendants who were on furlough are coming back um, November and December. So that will help to improve uh, the shortage on board the aircraft as well. Thank you all very much. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back my remaining time. Thank you. All right, thank you. The chair would like to now recognize Mr. Stanton for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I wanna thank uh, Chairman Larson for holding this very important uh, hearing. I wanna thank each of the witnesses for your uh, outstanding testimony today. Um, Mr. Andrews, I just wanna acknowledge you and say, I'm so sorry about the incident of violence that you described earlier that you were the, that you were the victim of. Uh, as someone who is fortunate to travel twice a week to my job in Washington, DC, uh, I'm deeply concerned about the sharp increased number of incidents of disruptive passengers reported by airline crews. Flight attendants, they are on the front lines in dealing with the escalation in disruptive behavior from passengers, and they need the tools and support at all levels. 
the federal government, from airports, airlines, uh, and others to deal with these challenges. Their primary job is the safety of passengers and crew, yet they are all too frequently finding themselves in difficult situations every day working to de-escalate situations, whether verbal or physical, that have the potential to impact safety. Many of the incidents we have seen reported have been on planes while in flight, but we are also witnessing disruptions within our airports. In the past year, staff at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport in my state and, and local police have responded to nearly 3,000 calls of customers being disruptive or assaulting employees or fellow passengers. This is a significant increase from the previous year, and it is not uncommon for our local police to be called to meet a flight with a passenger who has disrupted or interfered with flight crew. Uh, my first question is for Mr. Andrews. In your written testimony, you described your experience as a flight attendant, and you described many initiatives that uh, that uh, you uh, that you're advocating for. Uh, and I just want to talk about a few of those potential initiatives. Um, quote number eight is increased police and security presence at airports. Number nine, increased monitoring of passengers through the airport TSA and prior to boarding. Number ten consistent enforcement of the mask mandate throughout the airport and security. Can you describe uh, what you are witnessing in airports and what leads you to make these specific recommendations? Thank you for that question, sir. Um, I, I'm noticing on a regular basis when I'm traveling to and for to work that there's um, minimal police presence. There's um, a shortage in TSA staffing that's impacting how many people can get through or how uh, people are monitored. A shortage at gates with gate agents that's impacting whether or not we have the staffage to cover and monitor passengers as they're boarding the aircraft. Um, those are some of the things that are leading uh, to some of those suggestions. Thank you so much. Not only have we witnessed unruly passenger incidents and passengers ignoring the federal mask mandate on board aircraft, but we have seen this kind of activity in the airports themselves. Passengers can be seen without their masks within airports, even though individuals in airports are required by law to wear them. This is my question for Mr. Bidwell. What role are airports currently playing in enforcing federal and sometimes local mask mandates within airport terminals? Congressman Stanton, thank you very much for the question. Airports do their due diligence to enforce federal security requirements, including the mask mandate. A key part of enforcing the mask mandate is providing support to their airline partners in order to address incidents on the ground. Some airports have encouraged airline representatives to call airport law enforcement at the first sign of a disturbance. And I would also note that um, just to, to address something that was mentioned previously, a majority of mask related incidents do not occur at the airports. And again, just reiterate our support for TSA having increased the civil penalties for violations of the mask mandate. Thank you. Uh, obviously this Congress has been very supportive of the industry through the PSP. Thank you for the leadership of uh, President Nelson. We've also been very supportive of nation's airports knowing how important it is for our uh, our economy, uh, especially during and to get us out of the pandemic crisis. But Mr. Bidwell, what additional resources do you think airports need now to ensure a better enforcement of uh, mass mandates? I, I think that there have been a number of things that, that have been done that really assist in this regard. Um, you know, as I mentioned, TSA is having increased the civil penalties. I think another key component of that is for TSA to publicize the number of civil penalty actions instituted against violators of the mask requirements, much like FAA does in publicizing the civil penalties imposed on unruly passengers. I look like I'm out of time, so I have to uh, yield back. Thank you very much for those, uh, for those answers. All right, thank you. The chair would like to now recognize Mr. Fitzpatrick for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists uh, for being with us today. Um, Mr. Nelson, thank you for being here. Thanks for uh, incredible job you do representing um, 
amazing people in the aviation industry. And I wanted to just run uh, or ask two questions. So number one, focusing on the mental health, the morale uh, of flight attendants, um, which obviously is very, very important. Uh, they've been put under tremendous stress. Uh, they always have a stressful job. It's been incredibly stressful uh, for the past uh, year and a half to two years. Um, what can this committee, what can this Congress do uh, to help in that regard? Because oftentimes we're not asking the question, what can we be doing uh, to help these, these amazing public servants? <laughs> Congressman Fitzpatrick, thank you so much for that and for recognizing what flight attendants have been through. And I, I can confirm that the mental health has been under strain for sure. Um, our calls to our uh, EAP has been uh, through the roof. Um, and so what I would say to you is um, exactly what you have talked about so clearly. Um, and I just want to reflect because we just went through the 20th uh, uh, remembrance of September 11th. And I just want to remind people um, that uh, we were trained um, completely uh, wrong for that day. We had the wrong information to be able to address that, but we got information to the ground. Flight attendants did that. And that got to the crew and passengers on Flight 93. And the crew and passengers on Flight 93 could not be more of a rainbow of America um, than you would see anywhere else. All gender, races, cultures, and creeds, Democrats, Republicans, and independents. But in a moment's time with urgency, they had new information and they took action together to try to save their own lives, definitely to save our own, very likely to save our United States Capitol. And so what I would say is that what I've heard during this hearing is exactly what the problem is. Um, going on uh, the airplane, that people have been led to le believe that we're in conflict with each other. But the truth is, this is a small number of people who are acting out. The vast majority of people just want to follow the rules. They want a safe, uneventful flight. They want to take care of each other. Americans love solidarity. We need messaging from leadership that is consistent about what we're doing together to face this crisis and how we can come together and support each other in this moment. And that is the single most important thing that we need is leadership uh, from that level, from every level, from every corner of our leadership, giving consistent messaging about how frontline workers are supported, about how we're all, we all have to come together, face this crisis and do what needs to be done to get, put it behind us. Thanks, Ms. Nelson. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, the 20th anniversary of 9-11. I think it had us all reflect and quite frankly, go back and, and read the stories that you know, many of us haven't you know, reread since that awful day and hearing the, the heroism of so many of the flight attendants um, who were on the phone, uh, who had access to, to the phone, who were rallying um, um, uh, passengers on the plane. And um, it was a flight attendant that called the vote on flight 93. Isn't that amazing mm -hmm. that uh, at that dire moment, the first thing that Americans thought to do was to take a vote. And we all know how they voted and what the outcome was. Speaking of 9-11, uh, Ms. Nelson, if you could just touch upon HR 9-11, uh, a bill that I, you obviously know I'm very, very uh, invested in, secondary mm -hmm. barriers. Um, it's been you know, inconsistently applied with, you know, with, with regard to new aircraft. It's not even being put in all new aircraft. And certainly we haven't even dealt with the, uh, the retrofitting issue yet. Um, could you just touch upon that on behalf of uh, the people you represent? For, uh, absolutely. And, and first of all, uh, this committee and uh, Congress took nearly unanimous action um, in 2018 before this latest crisis to say that um, all new aircraft need to have that secondary barrier installed. This is a recommendation from right after uh, September 11th from the commission. Um, and it has not been done yet. Um, not even with the new aircraft coming on the line, uh, not to mention retrofitting. But this is an issue that was identified 20 years ago um, to make sure that our aircraft cannot be used uh, as weapons against us. And uh, it's, it, you've already done the work, at least uh, for the new aircraft. It just needs to be implemented. It needs to be implemented yesterday. And we need to take additional steps to pass uh, the your legislation to make sure that this is put onto all of our aircraft because this is an area of vulnerability. I would only add with that that the secondary barriers and crew member self-defense training were both recommendations that were supposed to be implemented and uh, really should be because this is an area uh, where we have a hole in our security right now. And thank you so much for your leadership on this. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair would like to now recognize Ms. Johnson from Texas. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I must admit that I have had to dip in and out of this meeting for another one, but I want to express my appreciation for this very important uh, hearing and for the witnesses to be present. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put my opening remarks uh, in the record, uh, so I won't have to read them. Oh, well, just yesterday, in fact, my hometown newspaper, the Dallas Morning News, an article entitled Inside a Flight Attendant's Self-Defense Class as Threats of Violence Fill the Air, described how federal air marshals are teaching flight attendants to defend themselves against belligerent passengers, generally in response to the resistance to wearing a mask. Now, I represent an area where the, where the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, TSA office, which encompasses nearby headquarters of American Airlines and Southwest Airlines, both are very large carriers uh, from my district. Uh, and I hope this question has not been asked, uh, but I would like to point it to Ms. Nelson, but I'd like to hear if there's any other comments from other witnesses. Your, your testimony makes uh, multiple references to the lack of assault investigations and serious punishment for the offenders, even though stipulated by federal law, is rarely carried out by the Department of Justice. What do you think can be done to rectify this? And is there anything that this committee can do? Uh, thank you so much, uh, hold, Congressman Johnson. Hold on Johnson. one second, um, Ms. Nelson. Uh, Ms. Ms. Johnson, can you please turn on your uh, video on, as, if you can, please, your video monitor? Yes. All right, go okay. ahead, Ms. Okay. Nelson. I am in thank person. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to see you, and it was great to see you at Dallas uh, Airport last month. Um, hmm. So <laughs> um, thank, thank you for the question. Um, we already have statute. Uh, DOJ already has authority under the law to prosecute. And we do need uh, encouragement from this Congress to encourage DOJ to take those actions. To my knowledge, so far they have only taken up one case um, of these incidents that have occurred since the beginning of 2021. Uh, so we need a greater a, a greater uh, attention on that, and um, there is uh, uh, representatives from across the industry have signed a letter long ago asking for DOJ to take that action. Um, so all of us have made it very clear that we believe that we need to, need to make it clear to the public about the seriousness of this um, of these disruptions in the air and how it how it can have such a, a dramatic impact on safety and security um, of our air travel, and we all know that. When safety and security is in question, uh, people don't buy tickets because they want to take that. Uh, so it's they want to take that for granted. So it is our economic security at stake as well. Thank you very much. Any other witness like to comment on that? Uh, yes, Congresswoman. I would just simply add, um, you know, echo Ms. Nelson's sentiments. There, we have all worked together um, on this specific issue. Um, and and uh, in response to your question about what more the committee could do, um, we would very much encourage you to speak with the Department of Justice and urge them to uh, direct federal prosecutors to dedicate the resources to handle these cases. Thank you. Any other comments? Congresswoman, I'd just like to add, uh, I support the comments of, of my colleagues, uh, but in addition, uh, just, just to reiterate, it's, it's important for crew members to stay around and provide statements to airport law enforcement and press charges so unruly passengers can be criminally prosecuted. Thank you very much. Mr. Andrews, did you wanna chime in? Yes, Ms. Johnson, thank you so much for that question. Um, just I echo the sentiments of my colleagues and one other thing would just be uh, so vitally important for that information if there is prosecution, if there is something done for that information to be conveyed back to the flight attendants that would encourage them to uh, report in the future. Well, thank you very much and uh, I'll yield back the last 30 seconds of my time, Mr. Chairman, thank you. 
All right, thank you. Uh, the chair would like to now recognize Mr. Stauber for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first off, I would like to thank you all for stepping up over the last year and a half, especially in the early days of COVID, uh, the early days of the COVID shutdowns. You know, I flew several times during the early uh, months of the pandemic and, and the front-facing uh, workforce, each of you represent, were always positive and professional dis despite massive mass layoffs and suspensions due to, due to an industry that had effectively been uh, put on pause. As many of you likely know, I have a son, my wife and I are blessed with a son who has Down syndrome. My family understands the difficulties that those with disabilities and their families encounter when traveling. We have seen these episodes play out time and time again on airplanes where families with autistic kids as young as two are booted off airplanes because their son or daughter has difficulty keeping their mask on. These are heartbreaking scenes that are objectively unfair to the families who are in good faith just trying to get from point A to point B, and it's unfair to the flight attendants and the staff who have been forced to enforce these rigid mandates. As you all are also likely aware, the Department of Transportation has put forth a rule for mass exemptions for those with disabilities, and it states, in quotes, the following narrow subset of persons with disabilities are exempt from CDC's requirement to wear a mask. A person with a disability who, for reasons related to the to the disability would be physically unable to remove a mask without assistance if breathing becomes obstructed. Examples might include a person with impaired motor skills, a uh, quadriplegia, or limit restrictions, a person with intellectual, developmental, cognitive, or psychiatric disability that affects the person's <laughs> ability to understand the need to remove a mask if breathing becomes obstructed. The question is for uh, Teddy or Sarah, I don't think that Americans with disabilities are really aware of these exemptions, and I know that many of them feel discriminated, discriminated against right now. What is the protocol that a flight attendant currently goes through when dealing with a passenger who, ha who has an exemption? Uh, Mr. Janet, let me start, and I, th I think Teddy will have a lot to add as well. Um, first of all, uh, let me just say that it is very difficult for flight attendants at minimum staffing with our aircraft full um, to be able to identify problems or issues as people are coming on the plane. It's very important that the airlines are making it very clear at the point of ticket sale um, for anyone who needs to provide information to the airline ahead of time about these challenges. This does already exist. It is already in the ticketing process. It could probably be more clear. When we have that information, that information is communicated to the crews ahead of the flight. We're given uh, seat numbers. We're given information about that situation. And when we have that, we are much better prepared to face that. So I will me, tell you that. Let me just ask you, let me just, I just want to follow up on that. So if they didn't, you know, at, uh, in advance notify the airline, if they are boarding and you clearly see that and the a guardian or, or parent notifies you at that moment, then do you, can you make the decision and, and follow the same protocols as if they had let the airlines know? Can you, can you at that moment, if a mom and dad or a guardian says, um, Sarah, this is uh, our child, uh, he's autistic and he, and he has trouble wearing a mask, at that point, then you can make the decision and let the other uh, flight attendants know? That depends, okay? And so in most cases, yes, flight attendants are going to be able to take that information, share it with the rest of the crew and be able to address that. We have had some situations where people have um, purposely tried to avoid this. So normally what we would do is we would notify uh, the ground supervisor and try to get help to that family prior to the flight taking off so that they can provide the proper documentation to the airline and that can be um, properly uh, 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 done so that we are advised that we should follow those protocols. But I will tell you that flight attendants have an incredible ability to have um, a, a, intuit, a very intuitive nature of how to address these issues and can assess these things. And we will take action sometimes on our own under that authority. That is not the procedure though. So it is better that we have that confirmation from the airline so that we know that we are fully backed up by the airline when we're taking that action. Well, I appreciate, uh, I, I appreciate the answer. And I will just say that uh, there are times maybe you don't know uh, if there's somebody autistic or what have you, but it is difficult. And I wanna again, thank you uh, and all the flight attendants for the professionalism during this difficult time 
and to enforce mandates that uh, were forced upon your industry and your profession. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I see my time is out, so I will yield back. Thank you. All right, thank you. The Chair would like to now recognize Mr. Payne for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here today on uh, a uh, committee hearing that is so vitally important to the American people and um, uh, people that work in the aviation uh, industry. <clears throat> uh, there is no pro there's no question that the FAA should institute more policies to better protect flight crews during this unprecedented, unprecedented rise in air rage incidents. Uh, beyond additional signs and verbal warnings about consequences, how best can the FAA help protect all flight crews if incidents like these are uh, continuing? Uh, Ms. Ms. Nelson? Uh, thank you very much for that question. First of all, I do want to applaud the FAA for uh, the um, seriousness that they have given this and their efforts to try to uh, communicate to the public uh, what the rules are, why they're in place, and what will happen if people break them. Um, the FAA has been extraordinary on this, and I, I applaud uh, FAA Administrator Steve Dixon, Dixon for his leadership on it. Um, what could happen, though, is that we hear from the uh, air, from the FAA safety inspectors that they do not have enough inspectors or enough time to conduct these investigations in some cases. So because of the zero tolerance policy, it used to be that the FAA inspectors would be inspecting events um, on a uh, first in, first out basis. They now have the ability to prioritize these issues based on the severity of the case. But if they get down um, to a six month timeout, there is a statute of limitation on the case of six months. So if they don't get to the case by that time because they don't simply don't have enough resources to address it, the case falls away completely. So they uh, suggest that there should be an extension of that time. And of course, if we could get more resources to the FAA to be able to conduct these investigations, that would better support us as well. Thank you. And. Um... Mr. Andrews, um, let me commend you uh, for your professionalism, um, preserving um, your job through um, the vile racist incident uh, you were called in your testimony and your personal fight against COVID-19. Uh, I'd like to discuss the uh, secondary barriers under the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018 the FAA is required to issue a rule requiring installation of barriers that would protect uh, the cockpit even when it's open. Unfortunately, the FAA has not fulfilled this legal requirement. How would how would you how would these barriers further protect the safety of the flight crew and passengers from unruly passengers? Thank you for that question. Um, I think uh, any steps that we can take, especially that second barrier, uh, would help with protecting flight crew, passengers on board. Having personally, my family experienced um, the death of my cousin in 9-11 uh, definitely would uh, make it more secure, uh, make sure that we have additional steps in place to ensure the safety of all passengers and flight crew. So I think it's vitally important to have. Thank you. Um, and let me just say to um, Ms. Nelson and Mr. Andrews um, that the gentleman from Pennsylvania made good points on the second barrier, Mr. Fitzgerald, and I'm going to reach out to him to say how we can work together to finally get this implemented. And I make that promise to you. I will start working on that uh, today. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bayer. Uh, can you assure this committee that your member, member airlines will be cooperative uh, should the FAA take additional actions to protect flight crew and passengers? Yes, sir. Um, we certainly uh, always comply with any law or federal requirement that we uh, have been asked to, uh, to implement. Okay. Well, thank you for that concise answer. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. 
All right, thank you. The chair would like to now recognize Mr. Lynch for five minutes. If not, we'll move on to Mr. Allred for five minutes. Okay, moving on to Mr. Garcia for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, for accommodating me at today's committee hearing and for allowing me to ask these questions. As a frequent air traveler and a former union member, I wanna thank the flight attendants, pilots, ground crews, and the aviation unions for the work that they do every day, keeping our aviation system running and safely getting millions of Americans to their destinations. I'm deeply concerned with the large increases in air uh, rage uh, and assaults on flight attendants and other aviation workers. Since the pandemic started, every person deserves a safe, harassment-free workplace. I think the witnesses, I want to thank the witnesses for appearing today and their enlightening testimony. I look forward to working with them and the committee to address this important issue. Uh, I have questions that I'd like to ask of uh, Ms. Nelson and Mr. Andrews. I'd like to follow up on a question posed by Congressman uh, Hank Johnson. What more needs to be done to specifically make sure that flight attendants of color uh, who may be disproportionately facing more uh, air rage and other discrimination are safe in working environments. Hey, would you like to start? <laughs> okay, so let, let me just uh, start here. Um, what happens in our communities uh, comes to our aircraft and the more that we can do um, to lift up uh, people of color to make sure that there is a place um, at the table, uh, to make sure that there is a recognition of the struggles uh, that people are facing um, simply because of the color of their skin. I will tell you that um, as uh, we were um, uh, going to work in the wake of the George Floyd murder, that there were many flight attendants who were concerned about even traveling to work. Um, and they were concerned about that before they even got there. And then when they get to work, um, they, are, um, they are facing uh, incredible discrimination that none of us can imagine if you ha haven't faced it before. It, uh, some of the airlines are doing a very good job of having town halls lifting this up. I would say, actually, um, I've, I've been recently made aware of the actions of American Airlines to uh, hold these town halls to make it very specific that the airline is focused wholeheartedly on addressing the issues of diversity and inclusion, of giving the opportunity for people of color to tell their stories at the airline about what they face and have other people hear that um, and hear the difficulties, um, the microaggressions uh, that they face at work. Um, and when they have the backing of everyone at the airline and know that those issues are going to be taken seriously, they are more likely to report, there is more likely to be follow-up action and other people are, are more likely to understand that when you are disrespecting someone because of their gender or their race or um, because of the way that they identify, that that is unacceptable. And there's a, there's a zero, zero tolerance approach from the airline to addressing that. That needs to be taken as seriously as any other violation at the airline. And so I would lift up uh, what American has been doing. Um, I would say I've seen it at other airlines too. Uh, they all have diversity and inclusion programs, but more could be done to have these public conversations about what people of color are facing at work. Thank you. I too, thank you for that question, uh, Representative Garcia. Um, I think I would echo wholeheartedly what my colleague, Ms. Nelson, just said. Um, the airline is taken specifics. Specifically, excuse me, American Airlines has taken steps towards making sure that there is uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, conversations happen. And the APFA has just instituted um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion team, um, which I am now chairing. So we're having conversations, and those conversations are having. Should there be more conversations? Yes. Uh, clear expectations on behaviors and, and, uh, 
some possible consequences for those. When we're talking about air age, uh, air age that knows no color, right? It's, it doesn't discriminate. But unfortunately, there are cases where race and other disparaging remarks or comments are being made uh, towards flight attendants of color and um, just conversations, more conversations and more dialogue um, between the airline and all of our counterparts would help. Thank you so much. Uh, my, my time has just about run out, so I'm going to uh, yield back to the chair. Thank you. Mahalo, Mr. Garcia. The chair would like to now recognize Mr. Allred, Texas, for five minutes. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I first wanted to ask about uh, jurisdictional issues. I've heard from uh, some flight attendants that I've spoken to uh, that there's concern and, and issues on the ground regarding whose jurisdiction it is when something happens. Uh, and you know, having you know, seen how jurisdictional issues can play out in other contexts, uh, I'm wondering you know, who is ultimately responsible when an event occurs in the air and you get to your location, which jurisdiction is responsible? And does there need to be an adjustment to policy to make sure that there is no gap uh, in terms of, of who's going to respond to it? And, you know, really, I'll, uh, Ms. Nelson, if, I see you nodding. If you want to jump, go first. And if anyone else wants to add, I'd, I'd be happy to discuss that. Thank you very much. So, um, Congressman Allred, um, the jurisdiction on the plane is the FBI. Um, it is federal jurisdiction, but oftentimes um, there's not an FBI agent at uh, an airport to be able to respond. Uh, some of the larger hubs there is, and, and when we get that communication um, to the agency, they can respond directly to the flight and get the statements from everyone right there, and that is the, the best case scenario uh, for dealing with these issues. Um, most of the time when uh, the aircraft arrives, there think about the uh, chain of communication. So the flight attendants uh, communicate to the flight deck, the flight deck communicates to the ground controller. The ground controller oftentimes will uh, communicate to a ground security uh, coordinator who will then have to communicate to law enforcement. If there's a break in that chain and you either slow down the communication or it doesn't go through, sometimes you don't have anyone respond at all. When local law enforcement responds, what they are doing is they are taking statements and sometimes taking people into custody. Um, but there is inconsistency there because at some airports, it is a security company that's providing the security. And in other cases, there is local law enforcement. So there is inconsistencies um, at each airport um, because of this. Uh, it would be much better if there were a clear set of standards that the airlines and the airports would be following that then gets those reports. When those reports go to the FAA, that can then be coordinated with FBI for follow-up action, even if FBI is not there to meet the flight. That's, that's, that's really good. So do you think that's the FAA's uh, within their purview to, to make that kind of action, uh, or do you think we in Congress need to give them additional authority? So uh, the FAA would need additional authority, authority to actually oversee that. Um, what I will say is that I know that FAA administrator has started a dialogue with local law enforcement across the country about how we can pre create better protocols. And that dialogue, even in and of itself, is very, very helpful um, for us to set up protocols that are better to respond. I will tell you that when, when I saw the images um, at, after January 6th, and there were sort of mobs of people acting out in the airport, and you saw that law enforcement, all they could do was protect the people who were being attacked. Um, that was a very different scene than we have seen in the past. We, it used to be that there would be one bad actor that law enforcement could go there and address that directly. That person would be hauled away. So we have a new set of conditions here where we need, need to make sure that we have better communications and that we're properly resourced at the airports to be able to respond. Um, thank you for that, Ms. Nelson. And, you know, you mentioned in the 6th, uh, you know, I know there's been some discussion of a the creation of a no-fly list for domestic terrorism. Uh, and, and I, I just wonder uh, what your view of uh, proper use of a no-fly list might be, you know, obviously taking into account the need to protect civil liberties uh, and, you know, some kind of uh, need for that to be a fair system in which and it wouldn't be a permanent mark on, on people's records and things like that. Uh, 
So the no-fly list is very specific uh, to the FBI no-fly list, and this is about terrorism. So first and foremost, we need to call it something else very likely. We need to have a process that is very clear, that is an incident review process with uh, the airlines, possibly the airports and law enforcement, where we're reviewing uh, whether or not someone should be put on a flyer banned list. Um, I'd call it something like that and then a process for how someone might be able to get off of that list as well. And so thinking through those procedures uh, needs to be done. There has already been some work underway at many of the offices. We appreciate that, um, but we need to speed this up and figure out how we can make this work so that we're addressing, yes, as you said, the issues of civil liberties, um, that there is actually a due process uh, for this, for getting on this list, and then a means at some point uh, to have a process to uh, appeal to get off the list. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate your testimony. You helped us identify, I think, some uh, some gaps in uh, what we can do. And I just want to say uh, thank you for your uh, you know, service to the country during a time when many of you were still flying at the very beginning of the pandemic, when uh, you weren't even allowed to wear masks at times, and you had to you know, protect yourselves in every, any way you could. I know it's been an extremely difficult time. Uh, I and the members of this committee are committed to uh, protecting you, supporting you. We appreciate the role you play in our economy. Uh, and as someone who represents you know, one of the bigger airports in the country and, and a couple of the airline, largest airlines in the country, uh, we appreciate uh, everything you do. So with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Congressman Allred. Mahalo, Congressman Allred. Um, the chair, I guess, will now yield to himself, since I look like to be the last person here and one of those opportunities of being last if, is if you uh, have had a chance to hear all the questions and there's been a lot of great questions that have been asked. You know, as, as someone who uh, was born into the airline industry, my mom was a 35-year flight attendant with United Airlines um, and who married into the airline industry. My wife is a flight attendant with Hawaiian Airlines, you know, and who also is a pilot for Hawaiian. I want to thank our flight crews, our gate agents, our ground crews who have really been on the front lines dealing with um, unruly passenger behavior, uh, in, in many cases dangerous and, and violent acts of aggression. And I also want to emphasize uh, that uh, passengers uh, and individuals that assault, uh, threaten, intimidate, interfere with airline crew members that the FAA and the Department of Justice need to conduct swift uh, but thorough enforcement investigations. They need to impose at least civil penalties against those passengers. And if those civil penalties are not uh, deterring really criminal activity by these airline uh, passengers, uh, that the Department of Justice needs to look at um, how these individuals can be criminally prosecuted. And so that's something that I hope the uh, FAA and the DOJ uh, will do. Um, you know, in regards to masks, you know, we all want to, um, you know, stop having to wear masks on, on on airlines when we fly. But we do know that masks in combination with vaccinations are the most effective tool to stopping the spread of, of COVID-19. Um, you know, air travel is one of the most controlled indoor spaces um, and modes of transportation. And so um, the current guidance where we need to wear masks through uh, early January 2022, I think is a good thing. Um, with the Delta variant, with the upcoming flu season, keeping ourselves protected is really important. My first question um, was uh, going to be directed to Ms. Beyer um, and A uh, Airlines for America, and, and that's in regards to when the early part of the pandemic, airlines took uh, the step to um, change seating arrangements in the airlines to uh, space people apart farther. Um, can you speak to or answer uh, in terms of the airlines that you represent, have all the airlines gone back to booking at full capacity and are no longer blocking seats to maintain that social distance between passengers? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, and thank you for recognizing the work that we have all done as an industry throughout this pandemic, a really unprecedented, it goes without saying, time. Um, to, uh, to evaluate uh, what we knew about this uh, public health emergency. Um, and, and really, um, you know, I think the airlines have leaned into science since the beginning um, to determine what measures need to be put in place to keep all of our employees and the traveling public uh, safe throughout the pandemic. 
Um, in terms of, uh, of seating, you know, uh, as we've all done throughout this pandemic, we've learned more and more about this um, specific virus uh, and about the, the variants that have emerged. Um, and so our policies as the airline industry have, uh, have been adjusted along the way as we learned more um, uh, uh, about, um, uh, about the virus itself. Specifically on the seating, um, one of the things that we've done is work with Harvard School of Public Health to evaluate the risk of uh, transmission in air travel. And one of the things that they determined is that um, given the air filtration, uh, you know, two to three minutes, the air is cycled out, the HEPA filters on board, um, the mask wearing, all of the other measures, um, that you are safer on board an aircraft um, than you are in many other uh, routine daily activities. And as a result of that science um, and, and uh, uh, you know, studies from many other uh, reputable sources, um, that is when the decisions were made for those who had adjusted policies that it was safe to resume uh, a full aircraft. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is for uh, Ms. Nelson. In your testimony you wrote over the past few months, CWA ground service members across the country have experienced serious incidents of physical and verbal assault and harassment with few repercussions for the offending passenger imposed by law enforcement. By failing to follow the law and seek justice for the victims of assaults like these, a message is being clearly communicated that the safety of our airport workers is not a priority. Ground service members are the last line of security before these agents have the opportunity to board the aircraft and disrupt service. So my question would be, what do you believe are the next steps we can take to protect our ground service members? Thank you, Congressman Kahaley. Um, let's, let's be very clear. This is extremely important that we uh, protect the ground service members because as, as you said, they have the last chance to keep problems on the ground. And when there is no uh, follow-up, when they are physically assaulted, um, wh what do you think there is going to be the response? In many cases, there is a single agent at the gate who is dealing with all of the passengers. And they, they, when, when you are under threat, what you want to do is to get away from the threat. Um, what that does is it potentially puts a situation where there's a desire to actually put that passenger on the plane uh, to get them away. So these are some of the consequences that we that can happen if we don't take these acts seriously. There have been uh, gate agents who have been punched in the face repeatedly and no action has been taken. Uh, law enforcement doesn't come fast enough and, and the prosecution has not happened. There are at least three cases that are noted in my testimony that I would direct the Department of Justice to immediately that are very clear, well-documented cases of assault against these gay agents. There needs to be criminal action right away because otherwise we're sending the message to these, um, to these workers that they are on their own. And the decisions that they make then, um, that they will be forced to make for their own safety may not be good for the safety of all of aviation. That is the consequence that we face if we don't back them up. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, last question I have, I guess it can uh, be directed to both um, um, Ms. Beyer and Mr. Bidwell, but you had mentioned, uh, we had mentioned through this conversation that sometimes airline crew members, and it could also be uh, gate agents, are reluctant to stay around um, to press charges even when they have been assaulted. Uh, and I kind of would like to know what are the reasons for this and is there a way that we can um, either incentivize or do something to support those airline crew members so those cases can be captured and the investigation can proceed forward. And I guess we can start with uh, Ms. Um, uh, Ms. Beyer. Yes, sir. So first off, um, I will say right up front that our airlines are doing everything possible to better prevent and respond to these incidents. And that includes having regular dialogue with their employee groups, including the gate agents, including the flight attendants, including the pilots. Um, we take this extremely seriously and we want to make sure that our employees feel supported to be able to report these incidents and that we as their, uh, as their airline are, are going to take them seriously, are supporting them and are doing everything in our power to, uh, to address uh, uh, the issue. Mr. Bidwell. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. 
So in accordance with TSA regulations, airport operators provide law enforcement officers with arrest authority in the number and manner adequate to support their federally, federally approved security programs. And, and I would note the challenge is not the number of law enforcement officers available. It's one of jurisdiction or rather the lack thereof. Indeed, airport law enforcement responds when called, but can only enforce state and local law. In order to pursue cases, they need crew members to stick around. They need them to provide statements, whether those are processed locally or then referred on to federal government, including the FBI. All right, thank Congressman you. Congressman Kehaley. Yes, go ahead. We, 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 really, we really need from the airlines a clear communication to the pilots, to the flight attendants, to the gate agents that when these incidents occur, their first priority is to stay, write the report, report the incident, and make sure that the local law enforcement has all of the, that they need. So I agree that the airlines have tried uh, very hard to be supportive of crews in these events, but that clear communication to the crews that this is their first order of business um, after these incidents has not been made and can be made more clear. And those procedures can be communicated more clearly to all of the crews and the agents at the gate. Ms. Uh, Byer, you know, in response to uh, Ms. Nelson's comments, um, you know, what, what does the airlines do in terms of when a crew member, if it's in flight and they send a message uh, to the um, station manager that they're flying into, what do the, what do the airlines do to make sure that there are um, representatives of the airlines, uh, station managers, others that meet the crew at the aircraft and are able to capture those statements from the flight attendant or pilot to work together with local law enforcement agencies and take a, a proactive role to support those crew members, you know, when they do land at their locations, they've been working for a long time, they're tired, and they, at that point, just want to go home. And, and in many cases, um, these assaults, uh, Go unreported. Uh, so certainly, um, if if the crew uh, you know reports that there is an in-flight incident and they are requesting that law enforcement respond to the aircraft uh, upon landing, then the airline employees on the ground um, will uh, forward that request to the local law enforcement and and request that support. Um, I did want to come back to um, something I noted in my testimony which is this, this larger sort of cross-industry best practices effort that we are undertaking um, at this moment. Um, I think that the many comments that have been made by my fellow panelists today are evidence that one of the ways that we can continue to improve is by enhancing the collaboration, not just within airlines, not just within airports, um, et cetera, but across all of the aviation sector. And our hope is that this, this effort, bringing in all parties who have a responsibility, um, that, that we can identify what some best practices um, may be by, by certain entities that perhaps can be enhanced by others. And we're committed to doing that. Okay, thank you. All right, see no further uh, testifiers, I wanna conclude our hearing today and thank each of the witnesses for your testimony today. Your comments have been uh, very informative and helpful, and I'd like to ask for unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or wit uh, witnesses' responses to be included in the record of today's hearing Without objection, so ordered. And with that, our subcommittee stands adjourned. Mahalo. Thank you.